You wake up one day and groggily rub the sleep out of your eyes. After a few moments, you're alert enough to reach for your phone. Time to catch up on all the messages and Instagram likes and Facebook posts you missed during your sleep. Except your phone's not working. You have no service, and that should be impossible because you recently ditched T-Mobile. Shrugging, you reach for your laptop and flip it open, double-clicking on Firefox because Safari and Chrome are trash browsers. Oddly, Firefox refuses to load. You check your laptop's connectivity and, sure enough, no service again. Weird, you think to yourself as you throw on some pants and check on your desktop, which also has no internet connection. Now, edging to a full-blown first-world panic, you head downstairs to make sure mom paid the internet bill. You find her there in the kitchen aimlessly mixing something. You can't quite tell what it is because she has her back turned to you, but you think you hear her slightly groaning? Hesitantly, you call out to your mother, whose body suddenly jerks as she turns around slowly, moving very, very stiffly. As she turns to face you, you're horrified to see her dead eyes staring at you, and with a growl of brains, she leaps for you. You make a run for it, rushing outside and fleeing for your life, but the neighbors spot you and take off running after you too. In seconds, you're being chased by a mob of zombified relatives and neighbors, and they're almost upon you when you turn the corner and suddenly hear, GET DOWN! Instinctively, you duck down, and in front of you a military patrol in Humvees opens up 50 caliber machine guns, chewing the zombies to pieces. Overhead, you hear the roar of jets as 500-pound bombs are being dropped all over your former suburban neighborhood. Welcome to the zombie apocalypse. The previous scenario has been a staple of science fiction for decades, and stories of zombie apocalypses have thrilled and terrified generations of humanity. Yet, for the United States military, the zombie apocalypse is no laughing matter, and they have a plan to stop it dead in its tracks. Pun fully intended. Contingency Plan 8888 the United States military regularly creates think tanks whose jobs are to envision future conflict or disaster scenarios, and then draw up military and civil responses to address these threats. Throughout the years, American war planners have created plans for everything, from nuclear war with the Soviet Union to an enemy invasion of the U.S. mainland to responding to a massive asteroid or comet strike on planet Earth. Incredibly, the U.S. military also has several contingency plans to combat an alien invasion and that's no joke. These plans are highly secretive, as are the other contingency plans, and present military options to combat a variety of different alien invasion scenarios, at least to the best as our limited technology allows. Yet one of these contingency plans is unclassified and has been public knowledge for years. That's Contingency Plan 8888. Originally, Con Plan 8888 was developed as a teaching tool for American military planners. It was meant to be a fun exercise that introduced new war planners to the complexities of developing realistic response plans to a variety of contingencies. Because of the threat of war plans being made public, the instructors behind the original Con Plan 8888 exercises wanted to use a completely fictional scenario, rather than using realistic scenarios with real nations that could be mis construed in the public eye as an actual war plan. Because the US military actually has realistic contingency plans to counter an alien invasion, it was decided that zombies presented the best option for developing a practice war plan to allow students to learn the ins and outs of military planning. However, just because Con Plan 8888 was developed as a teaching exercise and not taken very seriously does not mean that it's a credible and fully functional plan. If zombies ever did kick off an apocalypse, Con Plan 8888 would be there to save the US from extinction. So what does Con Plan 8888 involve? First, the plan addresses the threats from a variety of different types of zombies. First is the PZ, or pathogenic zombies. These are zombies who are created after a host is infected by a virus, bacteria, or other form of contagion. Next are RZs, or radiation zombies. These are zombies created by extreme exposure to electromagnetic and or particle radiation. EMZs are evil magic zombies, or zombies created by an evil occult force. SZs, or space zombies, are zombie life forms that originate from outer space or created by the toxic contamination of the Earth's environment by an extraterrestrial source. WZs, or weaponized zombies, are zombies that have been developed in a lab somewhere to be used as military weapon, perhaps deployed by a foreign adversary. 
SIZs are symbiont-induced zombies or zombies who are created by the introduction of a symbiont life form into a healthy host. The symbiont keeps the host alive but acting as its personal puppet. VZs or vegetarian zombies are zombies who do not feed on flesh, human or otherwise, but rather who feed on plant life such as zombies from the Plants vs Zombies series of video games. These zombies pose just as great a threat to humanity due to their appetite for vegetation which can cause massive deforestation and the destruction of food crops. Lastly, the plan addressed the threat posed by CZs or chicken zombies, which are the only type of zombie that actually exist. These zombies are produced when chickens are improperly euthanized with carbon monoxide and left in a pile of bodies, only for the still living chicken to crawl its way out of the pile and walk around until organ failure kills it. Next, the plan moves on to discuss the effect of environment on both zombies and surviving human population. It notes that pathogenic zombies will be vulnerable to ultraviolet light thanks to the UV light's ability to impair the function of RNA, which comprises most viral life forms. Thanks to this sensitivity, pathogenic zombies are not expected to be active during noon or in bright sunny conditions and will likely be active at night. Evil magic zombies, space zombies, vegetarian zombies, and weaponized zombies are believed to be immune to any extreme meteorological phenomenon except for fires, floods, tornadoes, or tsunamis. For human survivors, the plan stresses the need for rainwater conservation, seeing as most public services will no longer be working. Also, groundwater or stream and river water is not recommended for drinking, as it will be unknown if it will be a vector for zombie infection. Humans who don't shelter in place in locations that protect from direct effect of air currents also run the risk of zombie infection if pathogen or zombification source is airborne. From here, the plan moves on to five phases of a response to a zombie outbreak. Upon news of the dead rising from their graves or evil wizards creating zombie hordes, the US military will initiate phase zero of Con Plan 8888. The phase is also called Shape the Environment and will focus on giving US warfighters as great warning time and strategic advantage against the zombie hordes as possible. Military and civil agencies will monitor disease vectors for possible zombification, identifying any ways that infection can spread and taking precautionary measures. With constant monitoring, the US military will be be ready once the outbreak reaches critical levels or is unleashed in full inside North America. All military forces will engage in renewed hazmat training as well as nuclear, biological, and chemical warfare training, already a routine part of US military training. Phase 1 Deterrence will begin upon receipt of a warn ord or a warning order by US Strategic Command. In a normal war plan, this phase of planning involves displays of military power so that foreign adversaries are deterred from hostile action. Because zombies cannot be reasoned with or intimidated, however, other forces which could further spread a zombie plague or aid in a zombie apocalypse, such as terrorist groups, adversary nations, and unethical bioresearch companies are targeted instead. Phase 1 will see the US military initiate large-scale training meant to show any would-be human collaborators that the US military can still operate within a toxic and contaminated environment, hopefully deterring evil bio-research companies or terrorists from aiding the zombie apocalypse. Phase 2 sees the initiative will begin upon receipt of an alert order by US Strategic Command. This will immediately initiate a complete recall of all military and reserve personnel and the immediate implementation of all continuity of operations plans or co-op plans as they're known are meant to ensure that no matter what happens, all of the major military commands are able to continue functioning as well as the civilian government. The plan will deploy all ground, naval, and airborne command and control nodes, with preparations to remain deployed for at minimum 35 days. This will ensure that the US military remains in control of its forces no matter what happens next. US Strategic Command will reach out to potential adversary nations, such as Russia and China, and inform them of preparation for counter-zombie operations, conducting confidence-building measures to ensure these nations don't believe the mobilization is using the zombie threat as a cover for military action against their own countries. The US Air Force's Global Strike Command, in conjunction with assets from other services, will immediately generate forces for strike missions against zombie horde concentrations not just here in the US but abroad. The rest of the US military will immediately begin fortifying civilian defense zones and enforcing quarantines where applicable. Phase 3 – Dominance will initiate a massive American military response against the zombie threat. Combat operations must be swift and completely eradicate zombie concentrations, as even a lone survivor can reignite a zombie outbreak. 
cities and other major population centers may need to be indefinitely blockaded by military forces while the civilians are relocated to more remote areas. Phase 4 – Stabilization will begin no earlier than at least 40 days after the initiation of Phase 3 operations. U.S. military forces will begin initiating local reconnaissance operations in order to determine the strength of surviving zombie forces. They will also locate isolated pockets of survivors and shepherd them to secure areas, as well as survey the status of basic civil services such as power, water, sewage, and lines of communication. Recon forces will also conduct surveys of the epidemiological security of the local environment ascertaining if a lingering zombie infection threat is still remaining. Phase 5 – Normalization will see U.S. military forces aid in the re-establishment of civil authority. Commercial and civilian infrastructure will be repaired as best as possible, and the restoration of functioning civil services will be a top priority. Con Plan 8888 aims to prepare the U.S. military to stop a zombie apocalypse dead in its tracks and highlights the specific actions that local forces need to take in order to ensure their survival and the continued ability to fight back against the zombie hordes. The plan does highlight some current strategic limitations, however, such as a lack of dedicated counter-zombie military task force. There's also the difficulty in ensuring a zombie is truly neutralized, though the plan does recommend that military forces burn all the bodies thoroughly. Other strategic limitations include the inability to maintain airborne command posts in the air past a week. This is because, while in-flight refueling could keep airborne command posts operational for a month or perhaps even more if needed, the airfields that support the tankers, which would fuel these aircraft, would likely be overrun by zombies very quickly. There are also serious defensive deficiencies for many of the nation's ground-based command and control nodes, as few command and control nodes within the United States are hardened facilities capable of withstanding a relentless horde of zombies. Con Plan 8888 recommends that facilities maintain a stockpile of lumber and train their personnel how to weld so they can better secure their facilities against outside intrusion. Lastly, the plan warns that there is little useful scientific data to be used by the U.S. military to counter a zombie threat, and war planners may need to turn to popular media for inspiration on destroying the walking dead. There's also a dire warning within Con Plan 8888 that of all the different types of zombies that the U.S. military may have to face, evil magic zombies may prove to be the most difficult to defeat, as they're animated by evil magic. The plan suggests the recruitment of the Chaplain Corps to combat this threat. A horde of feral creatures tears through the street. They might look human, but they no longer have the brain capacity to do anything but consume. God help you if you find yourself in their path. No, it's not the latest toilet paper hoarding frenzy, it's the zombie apocalypse, and it might not be entirely fiction. Could the zombie apocalypse actually happen? Possibly, in more ways than one. These are the potential undead outbreaks scientists are keeping their eyes on. Surprisingly, some of the people believe zombies actually walk amongst us and have for hundreds of years. The origin of the concept dates back to Haitian folklore, where the dead are resurrected by dark magic. The necromancer uses potions and rituals to revive a corpse, but what comes back isn't entirely human. It might have full physical function, but something in its soul stays behind. This usually creates a zombie who is lacking the ability to make complex decisions, but can complete simple tasks when instructed, making it the perfect slave for a sinister witch doctor looking for some free labor. These zombies can often be kept in this unfortunate stasis for the length of their natural life, but the spell can be broken if they're not given the proper substances to keep them in their stupor. And when they're awoken, they often don't remember anything of their time as a zombie, even if they've been missing for years. But is this only folklore? It was believed to be an odd tale from a traditional voodoo religion, but during the U.S. occupation of Haiti, they were surprised to discover that people were actually reporting to no residents who were turned into zombies. People would show up after being missing for years and would claim they'd been enslaved by witch doctors with only fitful memories of the missing time. Scientists looked into these claims and found a possible explanation for this, right down to the supposed return from the dead. These people might have been given a powerful neurotoxin that would have paralyzed them completely and slowed down their body functions to the point of appearing dead, followed by the application of the toxin Dactura stramonium. Derived from jimson weed, this can cause long-term disorientation that would leave someone in a fugue state and highly suggestible leaving them in a zombie-like trance. Could this create a zombie plague? In a word, no. While this is one of the only cases known of actual zombie-like behavior in humans, it might be the least terrifying prospect. For one thing, there are no detailed case studies of this behavior long-term, just stories of it happening in the past. Many of the case studies have been doubted by scientists who think it couldn't be sustained long-term. 
If these chemicals were applied effectively, it would only take one missed dose for the person to start regaining their full mental faculties. And a slight overdose of the toxic Jimson weed extract could kill. These cases aren't the precursor to a zombie apocalypse. They're a case of kidnapping and enslavement. More importantly, they're not contagious in any way. If someone under the effects of Datura stramonium bit an unaffected person, all that might happen is a nasty infection from the bacteria in the person's mouth. But outside of the human world, more threatening cases await. Fungi. They take many forms, like mushrooms that grow on trees and make for a tasty topping on pizza. But in the fungal kingdom, a surprising number of them are parasitic and some display a disturbing ability to affect other organisms. That's the case for Ophiocordyceps unilateralis, an insect pathogenic fungus that spreads itself in a disturbing fashion. And it has a particular target, the ants crawling around the canopies of tropical forests. They crawl through the trees, except when the tree gaps become impossible to cross, and they head down to the forest floor. That's where this sinister fungi is waiting, spreading its spores. They attach to the exoskeleton of the ant and start growing there, using enzymes to weaken the exoskeleton and allow them to take root in the ant's body. And once they work their way in, that's when the transformation truly begins. Because the fungus doesn't just affect the ant's body, it affects their brain. The fungus yeast spreads through the ant's body and starts generating compounds that affect the ant's behavior, starting with causing it to have seizure-like convulsions that knock it from its usual perch down to the forest floor. And there it stays because it now has one function to spread the fungus growing off of its body. When the ant is about to reach the end of its life cycle, it will attach itself to a leaf with its mandibles and die there, spreading the fungal spores from the massive growth on its head. This creates a morbid garden of dead ants to infect the entire population of ants in the area. And as the ant dies, the fungus continues to grow until the ant is covered in a large growth of fungus. In between 4 to 10 days, the ant transforms from a creature with its own mind to one solely devoted to propagating another species' survival. This has led scientists to give these creatures a disturbing nickname, zombie ants. But could they jump species to bigger targets? While the idea of a fungal infection targeting our brains is terrifying, the odds of them breaking that species barrier are limited. For one thing, the fungus is designed to target small animals with an exoskeleton. And if they jump species, it'd be to a larger insect or a spider. Humans don't have an exoskeleton. We have bones, which are much harder to break through. While humans do have some weak, unprotected points like our eyes, there's another element that protects us from a fungal zombie infection like this. We can notice and react to weird things happening to our body much easier than ants can. If we see a weird fungal infection coming out of our body, we'll either pull it off or go see a doctor. So the odds are that even if a fungus did start affecting humans, it would never be able to transform any of us into mind-controlled zombies, assuming no one decided they liked their new mushroom hat and just let it grow. But some species more terrifying than fungi are using the same tactics. Pretty much everyone hates wasps. From those nasty yellow jackets that haunt every summer picnic to terrifying murder hornets of Japan. But smaller creatures have far more reason to fear them, because many wasps have a truly disturbing method of reproducing. They lay their eggs inside a still-living creature, usually a large insect or spider, and the eggs hatch inside and eat the creature from the inside out. Usually the wasp uses its venom to paralyze the creature before laying eggs and just uses it as a cocoon. But one wasp named Zadipota percontatoria might have taken this tactic to the next level. It has the same sting and ovipositor that its larger, more dangerous counterpart does. But it doesn't render the host completely paralyzed while the larvae are gestating. Instead, it might do something worse. It mostly targets small spiders, usually younger ones, but as the larvae grow inside the spider's body, something unusual happens. The spider might be aware of the creatures growing within it, but it finds itself unable to affect or remove them. As the growth of the larva advances, the spider will eventually build a cocoon to immobilize itself while the larva emerges and consumes its host. The initial thought was that the wasp was directly affecting the brain of the spider, which would be a terrifying prospect. But now scientists believe it's more likely the larva exudes hormones that guide the behavior of the spider in a certain direction. Until the end, the spider doesn't behave in ways that are completely atypical for the species, but instead seems to mutually be protecting itself and the wasp. Of course, there is only going to be one survivor at the end, exactly the way the wasp wants it. But is this deadly wasp a threat to humans? The wasp is a much smaller wasp than the ones that attack humans, but there are wasps that pose a serious threat to large animals. The Asian giant hornet even has the nickname Yak Killer because a swarm of them can kill a massive animal with their stings. And they do kill dozens of humans a year. But these attacks are usually defensive, seeking to drive humans away from them. No wasp has ever tried to parasitize a human for the same reason no fungi has ever made a go of that big game. If a wasp injected a human with eggs, the human would likely go to the doctor and get them removed. 
and even if hormones were affecting their behavior to make them want to protect their carry-on, the odds are another person would notice and get them some help. That's why the species that do lay their eggs in humans, like the botfly, mostly do surface-level infections and hope the person just doesn't notice. So no wasp zombies coming anytime soon. But is a far deadlier threat lurking under our noses? Plants. They make our yard beautiful and they make for a lot of work pulling weeds. But these leafy organisms are the backbone of the global ecosystem, and that makes them uniquely vulnerable to parasites. A bacteria known as phytoplasma has been affecting plants since it was discovered in the 1600s, but at first they were assumed to be plant viruses. They create fast-spreading blight, abnormal plant growth, and odd growths that seem to have one purpose – spread the bacteria further. The bacteria starts in plants, spreads through insects, and moves back to plants once they've been pollinated by exposed insects. Some of the signs include yellow leaves and growths that attract insects, but otherwise the plants just seem to continue existing fine, regardless of the bacteria parasitizing them. But the truth goes deeper. These bacteria literally rewrite the morphology of the plant, switching it from growing flowers that would help it spread healthy plants to growing odd leafy growths that spread the bacteria. While the plants lack any brain function, the bacteria manages to get deep down to the base components of the plant and permanently change its core function. This is considered dangerous to the health of the plant, but it doesn't have all negative consequences for those who cultivate plants. The bushy appearances of infected plants can actually be desirable for those breeding certain plants because they can then produce more flowers. But in the wild, these bacteria spread fast and furious, turning every plant they infect into a puppet of their spread and every insect that touches them into a disease vector. But could this affect humans and create a zombie apocalypse? This is probably the most dangerous case yet, because unlike parasitic wasps and fungi, humans are just as vulnerable to bacteria as anything else. Countless diseases start from bacteria and devastate populations. But if this bacteria started using humans as a vector, it's not likely to turn us into zombies the way it does plants. That's because we lack the tools it needs to spread, and any change where it makes people start growing plant growths is the stuff of science fiction. What it could do is hitch a ride on us and use us to spread it the way it does insects. But it doesn't use the insects in any way besides being an insect-shaped bus. So if this bacteria could infect us, the odds are we wouldn't even know it. And the only ones who need to be worried about the phytoplasmas are the plants. But at least none of these have made the jump to mammals, right? Parasites are everywhere, as any pet owner knows when they have to give their beloved Fido or Fluffy the dewormer medicine. Your cat might have just turned into a furry buzzsaw as soon as you uncap those pills, but at least they're not infected with a zombie parasite, right? Well, probably. But a parasite making the rounds is actually displaying a terrifying ability to puppet the largest animals yet. Toxoplasma gondii isn't some new parasite that's just making its way into the population. It's a widely spread parasite common in developing countries, and it's estimated that as many as 50% of the global population may have been exposed. The good news is it's not too serious in most cases. It can cause flu-like symptoms, but most humans who get infected might not even know it. What is scary about it is that it can infect almost any warm-blooded animal, including pets. But it's the interaction with two common animals that gives it a disturbing X factor. While Toxoplasma gondii can affect almost any mammal, its sexual reproduction needs much more specific conditions. It can only reproduce in the digestive tract of a domestic cat. It doesn't affect the cat much, but how it gets there is what's terrifying. When it infects mice, it has an unusual effect that's unlike anything else it does. It affects the mouse brains, reducing their sense of anxiety and self-preservation. Infected mice are less likely to hide when confronted by danger, and more likely to explore risky areas. This puts them at a greater risk of getting eaten by, you guessed it, cats, who now have the infected mouse meat in their digestive tract. The heavier the parasite load is in the mice, the more they're affected. This microscopic parasite does everything short of making the mice deposit themselves directly in the cat's mouth. Could it do the same to humans? Unlike the previous four zombie apocalypse candidates, Toxoplasma gondii has one scary advantage. It's already able to infect humans, and it's already shown the ability to affect mammal brain chemistry. We share a lot of common DNA with mice, and it's not hard to make humans do risky things, as every episode of a popular TV stunt show indicates. Parasites can mutate quite easily especially with fast reproduction, but the odds of this particular parasite mutating are slim to none for one reason. Targeting humans doesn't make sense for its life cycle. With the parasite only being able to reproduce inside cats, it only makes sense to evolve to target something that cats eat. Birds and other small rodents might be at risk, but Fluffy probably can't eat you, even if they seem like they like to every time you're three minutes late with dinner. But one potential zombie plague creator is already among us. It's one of the most terrifying diseases in the world, mad cow disease. 
Unlike most diseases, it's not a virus or a bacteria. It's a prion disease that affects other prions in the brain, causing them to all mutate in the same way. Its effects are terrible – memory problems, behavior changes, clumsiness, visions, and eventually blindness, dementia, coma, and death. The disease is mysterious, degenerative, untreatable, and invariably fatal. While a small number of cases are inherited or caused by genetic factors, it became infamous in the 1990s when it spread due to contaminated beef. One bite of a bad hamburger could kickstart someone's slow decline, and before the end, things could get terrible – not just for the victim, but for the people around them. And many people say it reminds them of something terrifying. Most zombie films have a standard type of zombie – slow, shambling, decomposing. They usually want brains. Brains. But a movie series starting with 28 Days Later introduced us to a different kind of zombie. They were fast, smart, and technically still alive. They were infected with a rage virus that made them viciously attack anyone they encountered, and the virus could spread rapidly through contact, including biting. While there were no actual undead zombies in the movie, the world that resulted looked a lot like a zombie apocalypse. And the origin was a released chimpanzee carrying a pathogen that jumped to humans. While it was all fiction, it was more scientific than most zombie outbreak plots, and many people pointed out that this origin sounded a lot like how mad cow disease made its way into the population. Could it turn into something deadlier? Mad cow disease, also known as variant Crutzfeld jacob disease, is already pretty deadly, invariably killing anyone it infects over a period of years. It's also highly contagious, being spread not just through contact with tainted beef, but through blood transfusions and potentially even donated sperm. It can also be contracted through eating squirrel brains, so sorry to say to anyone who appreciates that delicacy. What it doesn't have right now is the active desire to spread. The slow decline of victims usually incapacitates them and makes it unlikely they'll actively spread it after being diagnosed. But a mutation could make it faster acting and make victims display more aggressive behavior. It's no surprise that governments around the world are determined to keep a lid on this horrible disease, with the disease staying dormant for years. It's hard to tell if anyone's a carrier, and countries like Finland even banned British residents during the 90s from donating blood for life. But buried deep in the Arctic might be the start of a horror movie. The year was 2000 when scientists were exploring ancient ice in the Siberian permafrost. This area has not defrosted for tens of thousands of years and provides a rare time capsule into a world long gone. But when a sample taken from a riverbank was exposed to some test amoebas, scientists noticed something disturbing. The amoebas were rapidly dying off. A series of tests revealed that the permafrost contained a virus. But not just any virus. It was the largest virus humans had ever discovered, a creature named Pithovirus that measured a whopping 1,500 nanometers. Looking vaguely like a honeycomb when examined, it was unlike any other virus in the modern day. It was active and killing its target like no time had passed since it was frozen. Unlike most viruses, it could easily be seen under a microscope, and it contained as many as 500 unique genes, each of those ripe for a possible mutation. Already deadly viruses like the ones that cause HIV only contain about 12 genes. While this virus doesn't affect humans, that's only for a lack of opportunity. It may have evolved in time before humans and developed to target small, single-celled organisms. Naturally, humans responded to this in the sensible way, throwing the samples back into the permafrost and backing away slowly from the resurrected virus that had been waiting 30,000 years, right? Not so much. The French scientists who discovered pithovirus have been examining it since and testing its interactions with its targets to figure out how it's most likely to affect people in the modern day. The good news is, it's purely a relic of the past, right? Not so much. A modern species of the same genus was found in 2016, and studies indicate it has a very similar DNA to its ancient counterpart. The good news is, this indicates the giant virus is not likely to evolve to target humans in any way. It has a very specific spot in the food chain, and humans couldn't be further away from amoebas. What worries scientists about the pithovirus isn't this specific virus, it's that viruses from tens of thousands of years ago are still hanging around in the permafrost. Could something down there be more likely to affect humans? Entirely possible, although there's no current evidence of any virus that would create a zombie apocalypse. Scientists are advocating caution when possibly disturbing those frozen organisms. Good thing is the ice is staying right where it is, right? Hey, why is it feeling so hot lately? But scientists might not just uncover the source of a zombie plague, they may even create it. The human body is incredible at regenerating itself. If you cut yourself, there'll be a fresh layer of skin over it in a week. A broken bone will knit itself together after a few months in a cast. But there are some areas that cause a little more problems, namely anything in the nervous system. While the process of neurogenesis, the generation of new neurons, does happen naturally, the body is incapable of healing certain injuries. 
A person who breaks their neck might be in a wheelchair for life, while someone who hits their head in the wrong way might never wake up from a coma. This has been one of the last frontiers in medicine, curing brain and spinal cord injuries through triggering the body to regenerate. The key to this might be stem cells, cells that can adapt to become any other type of cell. When applied in the right way, they might be able to recreate dead nerve cells. But can they rewire the brain itself? So far, this is very much in the realm of science fiction, but scientists have been trying to figure out how to beat death for decades. Cryogenics research has been ongoing, with thousands of people volunteering to have their bodies frozen in hopes of being awoken at a later date when scientists develop the means to resuscitate them. The problem is no one knows what kind of damage the freezing process has done to either the body or the brain tissue, which is why any resurrection attempt would require some additional help. That's where stem cells come in, as some less than ethical scientists have proposed using this treatment to reverse brain death or experiment with already deceased. After all, these cells can regenerate dead cells in other parts of the body. What about the most complicated machine the human body has ever produced? What would happen? Well, that's the scary part. The human brain is still a mystery in many ways, and one tiny thing going wrong can result in an entirely different person. Regenerating new tissue in the brain might essentially do a factory reset on a person, creating someone highly suggestible. The result could make for a high-tech modern version of the people who are under the effect of the toxin in the rumored Haitian zombie plague. Could this be a great way for an unethical mad scientist to create compliant labor? Possibly. Could it be a zombie plague? There's no evidence of that because there's no pathogen the zombie would want to spread and it's unlikely someone in this situation would have the higher brain function to attack anyone. This scenario is the most far off in the future, as research into neurogenesis is focusing more on reversing short-term damage at the moment. But be careful what you wish for, because the most deadly scenario for a zombie apocalypse could be developing as we speak. Technology is getting smaller all the time. Remember when a cell phone was a big bulky thing that barely fit in your pocket? Now a smartphone is basically a thin sheet that shatters if you drop it. The same is happening to robots at a much smaller scale. Nanorobotics is a fast-developing field that creates tiny machines that are roughly a nanometer. So what could these do? Not much. But a whole lot of them could make a big difference. These devices are mostly in the research and development phase right now. But the basic theory is that they could all be programmed with the same function from a central point, then released in thousands or millions to tackle a task. Each one would attack a certain point, but together, the cloud of them would have a huge effect. This could be used to repair damage in areas where it's not easy for humans to go, like outer space or deep in the ocean, or even in the human body. These microscopic robots could be used to perform minimally invasive surgery if programmed right, or even perform long-range repair while staying in the body. But some experiments scientists are doing are much more worrisome. Designs are in the works for nanobots to not just repair things but to build more of their own system, essentially becoming self-replicating. But scientists weren't satisfied with designing the self-replicating smart robots too tiny for anyone to see, they're trying to see how they can be fused with living organisms. Scientists at the University of Nebraska experimented on integrating a silicone chip into a virus and discovered that the virus died, but the mechanical component still kept running as a humidity gauge for a month after its death. That's right, the University of Nebraska successfully created a zombie virus. What could go wrong? Is this going to create a zombie outbreak now? No, the nanobot wasn't programmed to reproduce and its function was limited. But that won't always be the case. One of the areas scientists are most interested in is using nanobots to potentially repair brain tissue. Neurogenesis with a cybernetic twist. To do this, the nanobots would need to be able to self-replicate. So in a few years, there could be people with self-replicating intelligent robots in their brains rewiring their brain chemistry. A central computer would be regulating their function unless something went horribly wrong, because if the nanorobots went off their designated function and wanted to spread, who knows what they'd be capable of. So while the origin of zombies might have started in Haitian folklore, it may be headed somewhere much different. The technology of the future. Day 1 it began and spread with alarming speed. For years after this day, you and other survivors will try to piece together any and all information you can remember and figure out when it happened, where, or even how. Some will think it was another virus flown in on a public airline flight. Others are sure it started right here in the US. Yet others think it just happened all over the world all at once. On day one, chaos reigns in cities around the world. Many people try to flee, only to end up getting stuck in traffic or huge freeway blocking accidents and ending up as zombie bait. You're smart though, you're a devoted infographics fan after all, so you know the best thing to do if you aren't already in the outskirts of the city is to shelter in place. In case of nuclear attack, you want to get as low as possible and take shelter at the very core of a building, far from doors and windows as you can get. However, in a zombie apocalypse, it pays to have the high ground. 
so you'll enter the nearest high-rise and make your way up as far as you can go. Power will soon fail, and with it the elevators, which means you'll have to climb dozens of flights of stairs to get up high. But that also means a zombie will too. Barricading every door you come across, any zombie or hostile group of survivors would have to cross a gauntlet of blocked doors to get to you, and being that high up will help you avoid the attention of both zombies and marauding looters, who might arise with the collapse of civilization. Every office tower in America is going to be stocked with food and water, so you're set to ride out at least a week, maybe two, as you wait for the events to unfold below you. Maybe this is only a local event and the military will soon respond to contain the situation, or at least fly out survivors. Just in case, you make sure to get to the roof of the building and make it clear to any airplanes and helicopters that survivors are inside. It's relatively easy to set up a big SOS, using brightly colored objects looted from amongst the upper floors. Like an ancient king watching a siege of his castle from the tower, you spend the day waiting and watching as the city below you comes apart at the seams. Day 3 As predicted, not a single zombie even attempted to make the climb up to your temporary shelter. Why would they when the streets are still swimming with poorly prepared survivors? trying to make a run for it, or hiding out in bad street-level shelters. By now, it's become obvious that this is not a local event. This is it, the zombie apocalypse and the end of the world. There's been no response from the military, and before the electricity died and your phone with it, the last thing you heard on social media was that the president had declared a state of emergency and taken shelter in an emergency bunker. The reason for no military response is because military bases were as overrun with the walking dead as any city. Some areas have been made secure, but there's still far too much chaos to coordinate anything more than local defense. It'll be weeks, maybe even months, before there's any major attempt to lift zombie sieges of the big cities, if it ever happens at all. There's tens of millions of the undead, and their ranks grow with every freshly slain human. You take stock of your food and water. Before the power went out, you filled up every sink, pitcher, container, even the toilets that you could find with fresh drinking water. You need water far more than you need food, though thankfully your food supply is pretty robust. Every office tower in America has multiple small kitchens, snack bars, and most even have restaurants. For the moment, food and water won't be your problem, but you can't stay here forever. Use your time wisely, so you set out rain catches on the roof of the building and keep your SOS signal free of any debris to make it clear survivors are inside. A few others from around the office building have joined in with you, and you've got the start of a small group of survivors. In a disaster, it's important to keep people occupied so they don't despair or do something stupid. So you take a leadership role and assign people tasks. The first is to fashion some kind of effective weapons and protection. You can take a cue from prison inmates and use duct tape and reams of paper to fashion some pretty sturdy body armor for yourself. Infection spreads via biting, so you make protection for your arms and legs as well. The armor can make you stiff, so you only make protection for your forearms, thighs, and chest. Just like a real soldier's body armor, you'll have to make sacrifices for mobility. No amount of body armor will stop a swarm of zombies if you're too slow or stiff to sprint or jump to safety. You fashion spears out of mops and brooms. These are great because while they won't do much lethal damage to the walking dead, they can keep them at bay pretty effectively. Sadly, there's just not much you can use for an effective weapon inside an office tower. What you really need is firearms or melee weapons that pack a punch, like baseball bats and axes. Those will have to wait. For now, it's better to avoid a fight altogether if you can help it. You place people on rotating shifts with frequent checks of the stairways that lead up to your shelter areas. In teams of threes, you start to scavenge the floors below you, being very careful with your progress to make sure you don't run into a situation where you can't quickly escape. There's a few straggler zombies up here, perhaps people who changed when the mysterious phenomenon that started this nightmare struck and they're easy to eliminate. You aim for the head out of habit from listening to years of popular culture, but the truth is, the rest of the body is as vulnerable too. If you shatter a zombie's leg, it can't stand up on that leg anymore. If you smash its arm, it can't climb or grab you. And if you break its spine, then it's stuck on the ground for good. Sure, destroying the brain is good, but breaking bones makes it incredibly difficult for a zombie to actually hurt you. With your spears though, all you can really do is pin one in place while your buddy stabs it in the head. It's a good strategy for the few you run into in the tower, but you know you'll need better weapons to survive in the streets. Luckily, before the electricity went out, you made sure to plot out the location of every gun shop, army surplus store, and police station within a few miles of you. You got a crude map and a plan. You're far ahead of the game versus other survivors. Day 7 Fires started days ago from unattended appliances, car crashes, and other minor incidents that the fire department would normally have attended to. However, nobody's putting out the fires, and it's becoming increasingly dangerous to remain in your tower shelter. Some of the group doesn't want to leave, but you explain to them that if they stay, they will inevitably burn up when the fires reach the building. 
There's a myriad of underground services and sewage tunnels that crisscross a modern city, and you briefly consider using one of these to get around and avoid zombies. Perhaps if you or anyone in your group actually knew anything about those tunnels, like how to get into them or where they go, it might be a good idea. The reality is though, if you don't have the first idea of how to even get into the labyrinth-like maze under your feet, you'll just have to use the streets. The underground garage has cars, but you have no idea where to find the keys. Besides, cars will draw attention, and it's best to move silently for now. The chaos outside has died down in the last few days, as the zombie all-you-can-eat buffet ran out of easy prey. You consider when to make your move. Daytime will give you much better visibility, but it will also mean the zombies have just as good visibility for you. Instead, you opt to move at night, and make sure everyone is wearing dark clothing. Holding your spears and skirting along the edge of buildings, your first destination is a police station only four blocks away from your current location. Sticking to the shadows, you stay out of sight of most of the wandering zombies. The bulk of the walking dead have followed the initial rush of refugees out of the city. They're acting just like any predator would, simply following migrating prey. This is a relief to you, because if not, the city would be a guaranteed death trap. There is the occasional zombie you stumble into, but it's easy to overpower one or two of them at a time with your group's long spears. Arriving at the police station, though, it's obvious others had the same idea as you, as it's even been barricaded. You should have known. Luckily, the world hasn't lost all its good people because the survivors let you in. It's not nearly as safe as your high-rise tower, despite now having access to a few leftover pistols, but it's a little further away from the encroaching fires. However, it's clear to both you and the survivors already sheltering here that this isn't a place you can stay. Not only is the threat of being consumed by the raging fires growing closer every hour, but if you're going to survive long term you need renewable food and water, neither of which you can get in the heart of the city. It's clear all of you have to leave, but the question is where? Day 9 After two days of deliberating, the group is split on how to proceed. The fires are close now and you need to leave in the next 24 hours or risk burning to death. One group wants to head toward the nearest military base, hoping it's held out or been reclaimed. This in and of itself isn't a bad idea, but it comes with a pretty big downside. There's bound to be thousands of other people who have the exact same idea, and all you're really doing is fleeing from one large concentration of people to another, which is exactly what the zombies are also doing. If the base is held, it'll likely be very secure at this point. Shambling zombies are simply no match versus modern military weaponry, but that's a very big if at this point. You've got another idea. You've watched infographics for years, and you know one thing about zombies that nobody else does. Without their hearts pumping warm blood around their bodies, zombies can't handle cold. The moment the temperature drops to freezing, even the fastest zombie is going to be a popsicle. You try to explain that to people, that it's no different than sticking a piece of meat in the freezer, but they just don't listen to you. They're sadly too brainwashed from years of characters on TV making really stupid decisions during zombie apocalypses and not doing the obvious heading north. Agreeing to disagree, you decide to part ways. You and your group load up two police SUVs with supplies, mostly food, water, and gasoline, you siphon from other vehicles. Surprisingly, there's not much in the way of weapons or ammo left in the police station, probably because the cops who were here when the world went to hell took it with them as they acted on their own survival plans. Your goal is to get out of the city and head north. Survival depends on you getting as far north as you can go. Day 10 your two groups wish each other luck and drive in opposite directions. The streets are a mess, but you manage to navigate past wrecks and small hordes of zombies. You wisely stay off the freeways, as they're bound to be full of traffic snarls and wrecks, and instead stick to surface streets until you can make it out of the city. Day 12 You took a full 24 hours to get out of the city thanks to having to navigate so many potential roadblocks, and there was no stopping your small convoy for anything but refueling. You're taking shifts driving until you're in open country. And today you raided the first gas station you came across for paper maps of the state and the North American freeway system. Your goal is Alaska, and you need to get there before winter comes or you could get trapped. You're tempted to loot some of the big department stores you drive past, but wisely think twice about it. Sure, they're bound to be full of supplies, but also full of zombies. You need to get out into more rural America before you start thinking about looting big box stores that could potentially be full of dozens of zombies. Day 15 You're making much better progress now thanks to your paper maps. You use them to avoid the freeways and use back roads, where the area is so free of signs of the apocalypse that you could almost swear it had never happened at all. But then you inevitably come across a wreck or the signs of a family having been torn apart and eaten by the walking dead. Still, you're out far enough from major population centers, you take the risk raiding a big box store. You've been mostly hitting small gas stations and convenience stores, but you really need to up your weapon game and it would help to get more food supplies. You enter the building as a team and in formation, no different than ancient Greek warriors would fight. You've been drilling like this during your rest breaks. One of the oldest forms of warfare in the world has come back, and for good reason, it works. 
Working together, you present a wall of spears to any zombie threat, and easily hack them to pieces without letting them get near you. Those on the first row stick their spears straight out and impale zombies on them, then step aside so those in the second row can lunge forward and deliver the killing blows with axes, hammers, or similar weapons. It's brutally effective, and you see why the ancients fought like this. The number one rule of zombie warfare is to never split up. So while it would be faster for you to investigate the store as teams, you stick together. You manage to score some badly needed camping equipment, a few rifles, and loads of rounds for each. You also get practical survival equipment like fishing poles and lures. You'll need those for your new life in the cold. Speaking of which, you make sure to snatch up any cold weather gear and first aid kits you can find. Day 25 You've made decent time despite having to keep off major freeways, and it's good because fall will soon be here and the first snow falls not long after that. You made it to Canada, where the situation is much the same as the US. This isn't a national crisis, the zombies don't respect any borders. Some of the group want to stop here, where the weather will be a little better than in frozen Alaska, but you know better. Bad weather is exactly why you're going as far north as you can. You need to stay far away from anywhere temperate for at least a year, maybe two to be safe. By that time, any reanimated flesh will have fallen apart due to decay or zombies will simply have been eaten up by wild predators. Humans kinda suck without guns, so predators like bears, cougars, and wolves will be having a field day, gorging themselves on walking corpses. Then a scary thought hits you. What if those animals become zombies too by eating zombie flesh? Or perhaps by getting bit while taking a zombie down? The thought of a zombie bear sends a chill down your spine and reinforces your decisions. You're going to Alaska for two years minimum. After that, nature should have run its course and there shouldn't be many, if any, zombies left. You continue siphoning gas from vehicles you come across and take more than you need for the trip. You don't know how many vehicles you'll encounter in rural Alaska, so you'll need plenty of gas for the future. In a dry, cool environment, gasoline can last for a few years before going bad due to oxidation, so you should be fine storing it even over the winter. You do pick up plenty of fuel stabilizer though from gas stations and mechanic shops you run across, as you'll need it for storing gasoline long term. You also grab spare tires. There's a very real risk of tire rot while vehicles are kept in storage. Just ask the Russians inside Ukraine. Day 40 The journey's been a lot slower than it would normally be using freeways, but you've managed to beat the winter to Alaska. Now it's a matter of finding a good place to shelter. Luckily, coastal Alaska is full of a lot of small resort communities or clusters of cabins for tourists to rent during the spring and summer, and the coastal waters off of Alaska are rich in all kinds of edible sea life. There's rivers everywhere which are also teeming with fish. It's the last truly untouched place in North America and life is abundant here. You pick a small cluster of cabins on the coast not too far from a river using a tourist attraction map you can find in most motels or gas stations. You also pick up plenty of canned goods that you can add to your sizable stockpile in the back of both SUVs. You never hunted before, and the last time you went fishing you were a kid. It's going to be a huge learning curve, but one that you can pick up with time. Until then, you're going to have to supplement your diet with canned goods, especially during the long, freezing winter. Humanity has thrived in every environment on Earth except Antarctica for thousands of years, though. You come from one of the greatest survival success stories in history, even if modern living has dulled your edge. If your ancestors could do it though, so can you, especially with the help of modern rifles and fishing poles. As far as the zombie threat, not only is your location remote, but as predicted when the temperature falls, the zombies you do come across in supply and scouting runs all start to slow down. Without warm blood coursing through their veins, the zombies get gradually stiffer and stiffer as the temperature plummets, and killing them is easy as smashing them into bits while they try to lunge at you in slow motion. It's going to be tough surviving up here in Alaska, but if anything ends up eating you here, it's going to be a bear, wolves, or Bigfoot, but definitely not a zombie. It's here. The zombie apocalypse. The dead roam the streets, and whether it was a plague, an ancient curse, fungus spores, or mutated rabies, none of that matters now. What matters is survival. But how are you going to survive in a world where you are now the main course for billions of flesh-eating zombies? As usual, the infographic show has your back, and today we're going to teach you how to keep from being the main course with our top 10 zombie survival life hacks. Number 10. Go North. No, even further north. Our first life hack is not really a hack, it's just more a general survive this nightmare and don't get eaten tip. When the zombie apocalypse hits, you're going to be joining millions of survivors all trying to figure out their next move. Some guy is always going to suggest you go to a government safe zone, because like he totally hears they've been working on a cure there. Don't listen to him, he's just going to send you on a pointless side plot and probably get a person or two killed while he's at it. Forget the government, because you're on your own. 
Now obviously you're going to want to get out of the cities, seeing as that's where most people live and those people are now zombies. Staying put in a city will be like rolling up to a fresh lion kill and wrapping yourself up with a carcass. So while you may be tempted to be near places you can scavenge for supplies, don't. You're going to want to find a place with abundant natural resources because from now on, your meals are coming straight from Mother Nature herself and she doesn't deliver on Uber Eats. More importantly, you want to go somewhere that zombies are going to have a difficult time finding you, or at least eating you. Flesh of any kind has a pretty hard time dealing with the cold. It tends to freeze and become very rigid and inflexible, and with no blood circulating through their dead limbs, zombies that freeze are going to become undead statues in no time at all. That's why you want to be going north, really, really far north. Like literally as far north as you can get. If you've hit polar bears, then you're on the right track. Sure, survival will be a bit difficult in those extreme latitudes, but you know what else makes survival hard? Being eaten alive by zombies. In the far north of Alaska or Canada, you'll only be dealing with approximately three months of mild temperatures before that thermostat starts dropping. And once it does, any zombie that's followed you up there is going to turn into a frozen popsicle. And at that point, it'll be as simple as leisurely knocking heads off one at a time. Number 9. Learn to get clean drinking water. Okay, so you've taken our advice and decided to head north into the wilderness. Now you're going to have to deal with one of the basic necessities of life, clean drinking water. Obviously, if you can hit up any local army surplus or survival gear store, then you absolutely should do that and get yourself some handy water filtration systems. But if you missed out or if man-made filters are just like too mainstream for you, then fret not. We're going to teach you how to make a basic water filter with nothing more than a plastic bag and a bunch of rocks and dirt. First, you want to cut a very small hole at the bottom of the bag, then line the entire bottom with a layer of rocks. Above that, make a layer of sand and then a rock layer again. Repeat two more times to make a total of four layers alternating between rocks and sand and voila, you have your own homemade Brita filter. Sort of. It won't get rid of microscopic contaminants like bacteria, viruses, and polar bear pee, but it'll do a great job of filtering out larger particles and make water mostly safe to drink. Number 8. Don't hit up an army surplus or survival store. You remember how, like, 30 seconds ago we told you to hit up a surplus or survival gear store? That was a test. And you failed, and now you're dead. In fact, you should be doing any zombie prepping now before the actual zombies hit, because trying to do so after the fact is probably only going to get you killed. See, it's like when you visit an online forum and see posts by hundreds of people all proclaiming how they would hit up their local gun shop first thing and become some sort of badass zombie killing vigilante, except literally everybody else is going to have the exact same idea. Not to mention, you know, the gun shop owners themselves, who by virtue of owning a gun shop, are probably pretty heavily armed. Rather than heading to a place full of desperate, terrified people who are now heavily armed, just use that time to get away. You're going to have a pretty narrow window of time to actually use highways and city streets before they become a congested mess, and it's far better to use that time to get out of Dodge while all the internet tough guys fight each other at the gun store. Besides, you'll probably be able to hit up similar shops in much smaller population towns long after the initial wave of panic has hit and most of your competition is, well, dead. Number 7. Stop aiming for the head Everyone knows that the golden rule of zombie survival is to aim for the head for some very weird reason. I mean, we're dealing with the living dead, the brain at this point is just a bunch of dead tissue. And yet the golden rule is zombies can't die unless you destroy the head. Well, we'll leave that for the hardcore zombie lore fans to figure out, but for the rest of us, we're worried about two things in our zombie apocalypse, survival and conserving resources. Aiming for the head is a notoriously difficult thing to do. You may be a whiz in PUBG, but firing a weapon in real life is quite a bit more difficult than video games make it out to be. There there's a reason why police officers and soldiers are taught to aim center mass instead of to take sweet headshots, and that's because center mass is far easier to hit and will seriously ruin somebody's day. Now a zombie may not have vital organs functioning anymore and can't bleed out, but they do still have to obey the laws of physics and if you manage to destroy a vertebrae or blow out a kneecap, that zombie isn't walking anywhere. Our skeletal system is easy to overlook, it's on our inside and literally just sits there your entire life doing a whole lot of nothing. 
But one of the things it does do is provide structural support for your muscles, and without that support we'd all basically be fleshy beanbags. For zombies, destroying that support is going to drop them faster than Taylor Swift drops number one hits about ex-boyfriends. And while it may not be a killing blow, that doesn't really matter if the zombie can't move around anymore. Number 6. Learn First Aid You're gonna get hurt in the zombie apocalypse, it's pretty much inevitable. Now, there's no hospitals to take care of you and no 911 to call and get an ambulance. On the one hand, it's kind of nice that you won't be shelling out your life savings just because you had to visit the hospital once. On the other, you're probably going to die now from totally preventable causes. We've largely forgotten our ancient past, and the modern wonders of civilization have insulated us from just how terrible life is in the wild but also just how terrible our bodies are for living in the wild. We're pretty much the slowest and weakest of animals amongst our weight class, and our bodies are just lousy at surviving in the wild. Our bones are basically made out of glass, in comparison to thick tough cow or bear bones, and ridiculously thin skin has no thick fur to protect us from the cold or cuts or scrapes, and it's gonna be pretty important to learn how to take care of yourself and others. So learning some first aid now before your neighbors are trying to eat your brains is going to do wonders for your survival. Number 5. If nothing else, learn tourniquets. Every American soldier receives some basic first aid training, but the one thing that every soldier learns how to use and apply to themselves or others is the tourniquet. Our bodies are not only weak and pathetic in comparison to the other animals, but they have a lousy habit of gushing blood everywhere that really should stay inside your body. For minor to moderate cuts and wounds, applying direct pressure with makeshift bandages and perhaps elevating an affected limb will do. When the wound is serious enough though and your body won't stop pumping all its blood out onto the floor, no matter how much you ask it not to, you're going to have to take some drastic measures. In these circumstances, you're going to want to shut the flow off as soon as possible, and the best way to do that is a tourniquet. Simply tear a shirt into a long strip and tie it around your limb with a knot. Then place a stick over the knot and tie a second knot over the stick. Now, you're going to crank that stick in a circular motion, tightening the strip of the shirt tied around your limb. You're going to want to really crank that thing, because your goal is to shut off blood flow. But you need to ensure that you're shutting off the flow from deeply embedded arteries, so you're going to require a great deal of pressure. Once the blood has stopped doing its best to vacate your body, you're going to want to secure the stick with a second strip of cloth and tie that as tightly as you can as well so that the stick doesn't unwind and loosen the tourniquet. Number 4. Store up fuel, but only if you plan on using it within a year. In every zombie apocalypse show or movie, there's always the scene of survivors hotwiring cars and making a last minute escape from a horde of angry zombies. In the real world, depending on how long ago the apocalypse began, trying to do that will only leave you trapped in a very much dead car, surrounded by, well, the dead. That's because gasoline can and does break down over time, and trying to store it for later use is going to prove difficult under the best of circumstances. You can use some commercially available stabilizers to extend the lifetime of gasoline, but the best you're going to get is maybe a year and two or three months. Same goes for diesel fuel. So if you're hoarding up fuel, then good job because you're becoming proactive about your survival, but also make sure you use it as soon as possible before it becomes useless sludge. Number 3. Learn to make fire without matches or a lighter. Yep, the fuel inside a lighter will eventually break down too, and matches, well, they can get ruined by the weather or zombie attack victims rudely bleeding all over them. Your best bet will be to learn how to make a fire the way our ancestors did, and if a bunch of prehistoric cavemen could make the fire, then come on, how hard can it be? Well, actually, it's ridiculously difficult to make fire the old-fashioned way, as many people who have to pass a military survival course have learned the hard way. Even if you know how to create a bow and a stick contraption to start the fire and happen to have great kindling, it can still take a very, very long time to get even a tiny ember going. Instead, get your hands on a magnifying glass, which should be easy enough to find at any science classroom. You can also use a highly polished crystal, which you can find in any new-agey mystical mumbo-jumbo store. As long as the crystal can focus light the way a magnifying glass does, you'll be able to get fire started in no time with nothing more than the sun. While this won't work very well on cloudy days, even with just a little bit of sun, you'll very quickly be setting fire to everything and anything you desire. Just remember, forest fires are still a thing, and this time there's no fire department coming to put it out. Be ashamed to survive The Walking Dead only to roast yourself alive because you didn't listen to Smokey the Bear. Number 2. Turn 2-liter soda bottles into cordage There's few things in the world more useful than rope, 
And in a world gone all zombie, having rope can be a literal lifesaver. You can use it for everything, from harnesses, securing doors, making leashes for pet zombies, and tying off limbs that refuse to stop bleeding. In the survival community, rope is known as cordage, and you're going to definitely want to get your hands on some. Typically, you can make a pretty decent cordage from tough, stringy plant fibers, pulling them off in long strands and wrapping them together to make a thicker single rope. This can be time consuming and, depending on where you are geographically, impossible. While it won't make a rope, though you can get a decent length of cordage that you can use for a variety of things from something that, thanks to mankind's refusal to actually put trash in the trash bin, is now a part of every natural environment. 2 liter soda bottles. Simply take your trusty knife, you did pack a knife into your survival kit, right? And then cut off the bottom of the soda bottle so that you're left with what's essentially a giant funnel. Then cut down into the plastic on one side of the bottle for a thickness of cordage that you want. And after that, it's as simple as cutting the plastic into a long, unbroken strip. The trick is to keep the thickness even, but with a little practice, you'll easily get the hang of it. Besides, it's not like discarded plastic bottles are uncommon or anything. There's literally millions of them in the ocean alone, keeping all the sea turtles company. Number 1. Build a shelter So by now, if you've taken our advice, you've left the cities behind and you're headed up north like you got Klondike fever. Civilization tends to get a bit sparse the further north you go, but because we're turning you into a bona fide zombie apocalypse surviving badass, you don't need no home, you'll make your own. While wild animals can sleep perfectly fine in the elements, we're pathetic, weak creatures who can't even survive one rainy night in the wilderness without the hides of other animals to protect us from the cold. Pretty high on your list of priorities, somewhere between don't get eaten by zombies and find food and water, you're going to want to put build a shelter. Your shelter should be tailored to your environment, and you'll need to learn how to make shelter suitable for the season you find yourself in. If you've headed up north, then during winter shelter will actually be pretty easy. Simple snow caves can be deceptively warm and comfortable, as snow is a fantastic insulator, and the chill of the snow outside your inner chamber will help keep the snow on the inside from melting due to your heating the place up with your body. You can even make small fires inside snow caves, though of course, you want to ensure that you have proper ventilation. To create a snow cave, simply dig into a deep snow bank about 3 feet down, and then level off a foot or two and make a sharp right or left turn, followed by one more sharp turn. The U-bend you create will help keep out chill winds and trap heat. On the ceiling, you'll want to bore out a small ventilation shaft just a few inches wide, because even if you don't light a fire, snow caves can get lousy with CO2 from all your breathing. In the warmer months, building a mound-type stick hut is quick and easy, plus surprisingly sturdy and good at keeping out rain and wind if built correctly. Start by finding large, sturdy branches to act as the foundation, and then lay them against each other so they form a large dome. The weight of the branches leaning against each other should be sufficient to keep them propped up, so your initial foundation is probably going to require a lot of large, thick branches. After this layer, you'll want to find smaller, leafy branches to cover up the first layer thoroughly. Then simply repeat for at least three more layers to create multiple layers of leafy branches over your foundation of thick, strong branches. Once that's done, add a final layer of thick, strong branches to make sure that strong wind doesn't blow your thinner, leafy branches away. In essence, what you've done is create a multi-layered structure that will be very effective at keeping the wind and even rain out, though you may have a few small leaks in places. If you want to take your shelter building game to a whole new level though, fill buckets with fresh, wet river mud and smear a layer of mud in between the leafy layers and the final layer of thick branches. Once the mud dries and hardens, you'll have waterproofed your makeshift house, and you'll be riding out the apocalypse in true hobo fashion. A lone wolf sits in the kitchen working on a homemade, world-ending bioweapon. Meanwhile, a group of computer scientists in Silicon Valley embrace and cheer over their completion of artificial intelligence they have no idea will destroy the planet. Volcanoes rumble and the flesh-eating gray goo of nanobots falls into the hands of a tyrant in this terrifying tale of how the world might realistically end. Number 8. Asteroid Impact We're going to start with many people's favorite, and that's all us guys down here getting wiped out because a giant piece of space rock decided it's time to finally meet our planet face to face. Asteroids are not to be taken lightly. You may have heard about a certain impact event that killed off a lot of living things around 66 million years ago. This thing smacked into the water just off Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula and formed what we call today the Chicxulub Crater. The event might have destroyed 75% of all species on Earth. Yep, that's the one they say ended the dinosaurs. 
It's theorized that it flew down to Earth traveling in the region of 45,000 miles per hour, and no sooner than you could say, did you hear that bang? Mexico was on fire. This made a crater that was some 62 miles wide. As for the power, the rough estimate is the impact created the force of 21 to 921 billion times that of the atomic bomb that hit Hiroshima at the end of the Second World War. This set off a series of catastrophic events, including a mega tsunami around 330 feet high, smacking into the U.S. coast. The impact would have also set off massive wildfires, volcanic eruptions, and earthquakes. Suffice to say, there would have been a lot of dust in the sky which would have blocked out the sun. That black cloud that covered the Earth might have hung around for a decade, so whatever was living down there, plant or animal, would have had a hard time of it. Add to that a lot of acid rain and there wouldn't have been much plant life left for animals to eat. If you think 2020 and 2021 were bad years, let's just say those dinosaurs had it much worse than you. That's why we now call it a mass extinction event. So you could be thinking right now, ah well, that won't happen again. But why not? It's not as if we have any control over what happens in space. There is absolutely no reason why there couldn't be another mass extinction event as a result of the Earth being hit by an asteroid. In fact, given enough time, statistically it will happen. We've been hit by a lot of asteroids over more recent years, although many of them haven't caused much catastrophic damage. Take for instance that one that hit Arizona around 50,000 years ago, which formed the Behringer Crater, named after the guy that had the land where it hit, Daniel M. Behringer. It's thought that the rock that made this crater might have only produced enough power to kill plant life and wildlife in the vicinity of the impact area since it might only have produced the blast force of one nuclear bomb. Still, something like that happening in a place like New York would certainly be a bad day for the city's population. Then you have the Qingyang event in China in 1490, which records show may have killed around 10,000 people. Only this was likely a meteorite shower since those records describe falling stones raining from the sky. We haven't had too many impact events to write home about in modern times, although in 1908 there was the Tunguska event in Siberia. It said this produced the power of around 15 megatons of TNT, which is 1,000 times more powerful than the atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima. Fortunately, not many people lived anywhere near it to be hit, so the explosion just wiped out forest land, and we're talking about 80 million trees. There were quite a few witnesses though, one of them described the event like this. We started crying out, father, mother, brother, but no one answered. There was noise beyond the hut. We could hear trees falling down. Chikarin and I got out of our sleeping bags and wanted to run out, but then the thunder struck. This was the first thunder. The earth began to move and rock. The wind hit our hut and knocked it over. My body was pushed down by sticks, but my head was in the clear. Then I saw a wonder. Trees were falling. The branches were on fire. It became mighty bright. Had that thing hit a major city, and for sure it's only a matter of cosmic luck that it didn't, it could have killed many, many people. According to NASA, to create massive damage you need an asteroid to hit that was one kilometer in diameter or bigger. The one that wrecked that Siberian forest was only around 66 feet wide. But just to let you know, over the many millions of years the Earth has been around, it's been hit by many asteroids that make a one kilometer rock look like a pea next to a basketball. The good news is that NASA says there is nothing in space right now of that size that looks like it could impact Earth. The agency added, as best we can tell, no large object is likely to strike the Earth any time in the next several hundred years. Phew! But if you take into account the law of averages and past events, well, you'd have to say that one day the Earth will get a major whack in again. In fact, some scientists say Earth is hit by such a life-ending piece of rock every 60 million years or so. And that could mean we are due for another bashing. Still, in cosmic terms, say 20,000 or 50,000 years is nothing. Don't go building your bunker just yet. But to finish this off, we think we should inform you that in 2019, an asteroid the size of a football pitch came within 40,000 miles of Earth. That's close in space terms, and NASA admitted that this rock, named 2019 OK, did sneak up on us. If something that size would have hit, it would have the potential to destroy a city and its suburbs. Ok, so that is scary, but it's very, very, very unlikely to happen anytime soon. In terms of your hierarchy of worries, you can shove asteroid impact to the bottom of the pile. There are actually analysts who study the likelihood of the end of the world within the next 100 years, and where a space rock isn't a major concern of theirs, this next one is. Number 7. Natural Pandemic This is probably not what you want to hear, given you've just spent the last two years mainlining the pandemic into your conscience thanks to the ever-vigilant, sometimes click-hungry media. Still, never in your wildest dreams did you think the recent virus was going to end the world or anything close to it. 
but there have been some pretty frightening pandemics before. You've probably heard all about the Spanish flu that ravaged some parts of the world between 1918 and 1920. It wasn't Spanish at all. But the reality is this flu killed somewhere in the region of 50 million people. Not world-ending, but it was hardly a scratch either. Then you have the historic plagues, which were certainly no walk in the park for humanity. It's thought that between the years of 1346 to 1353, the aptly named Black Death killed anywhere between 75 and 200 million people across Europe, Asia, and Africa. It killed between 30 and 60 percent of the entire European population. So while not the end of the world, the plague was darn efficient at population reduction. That was about as bad as it gets when it comes to killer viruses. But the question is, could anything close to it, or even worse, happen again? If you've been reading the news over the last two years, you'll know that many stories have started with the words, experts warn. Oh god, not another experts warn story, you probably thought while reading them. In 2019, the Guardian newspaper began a story with this, experts warn world grossly unprepared for future pandemics. The story described a scene that sounded like a Hollywood movie. In it, a virulent flu pandemic happens. Within a matter of just 36 hours, people start dropping like flies and no one knows where the virus came from. It causes mayhem, riots ensue, banks close, the power grid goes down, and 28 days later, there are barely enough people left to have a good, meaningful Zoom meeting. The Guardian wrote, minus the Zoom joke, such a scenario is entirely plausible and efforts made by governments to prepare for it are grossly insufficient. Many people think it's a possibility. In 2017, the ever-reliable harbinger of doom Bill Gates said as much. Although, he said a virus might just wipe out 30 million people. He talked about the big ones, which he said were in the pipeline unless we start to prepare better for such events. In his own words, you might be wondering how real these doomsday scenarios are. The fact that a deadly global pandemic has not occurred in recent history shouldn't be mistaken for evidence that a deadly pandemic will not occur in the future. The experts warn us that we might be hit with a mystery pathogen that we haven't seen before, and that pathogen might look invincible. That's why the World Health Organization talks about Disease X, which is a hypothetic, very deadly, unknown pathogen that strikes us down. This might come from an animal, but it also could be man-made. We'll come back to the pandemic wars later, but first, let's hear about something that humans do as naturally as breathing and might destroy the Earth before we finish this video. Number 6. War We really can't have a show about the end of the world and leave out war. Back in the day, when Attila the Hun's armies were embracing their violent side, you could kill many people during the campaigns, but battles like that were never going to pose a threat to mankind. Then we modern folks came around and someone got the idea to create bombs that could potentially end the world. The US has around 1,750 deployed nuclear weapons, that's the biggest arsenal, but Russia has around 1,600. And if you paid any attention to Rocky IV, Russia and America aren't exactly the best of buddies. Then you have China, and no one knows how many nuclear weapons that country has. So if you read this recent headline, threats from Russia more immediate, but threats from China greater, you might think, huh, well that's not great. Other countries with such terrible weapons are the UK, France, Pakistan, India, Israel, and everyone's favorite quiet neighbor North Korea. These countries aren't at war, and you could be accused of scaremongering by talking about war, but we don't know how things will be down the line. There's also the fear that as such weapons become more technologically advanced, they might become hackable. According to a scientist writing for the BBC, even if every single nuclear bomb was fired and hit a target, it would not destroy the Earth or humanity. Still, 14,900 nuclear warheads of varying killing power would make a dent in the human population, perhaps killing up to a billion people within the first hour of the blasts. Then you have the radiation sickness, which would finish off many millions more. But that would just be the start, because those bloodthirsty generals would want more blood. The war would continue. And what if every weapon at a country's disposal was used? All-out war could be almost world-ending. Using a theoretical scenario, some scientists have said that the detonation of all nuclear weapons could create such a mess that people would not be able to survive in the aftermath. Slowly, they'd get hungry and sick and die. There would be raging fires in cities and the soot in the sky blocking out the sun could kick off a nuclear winter. One scientist named Alan Robach, who took the temperature drop off a nuclear winter seriously, said this could end life on Earth. What if we built bigger bombs, those known as doomsday devices? The ones we dropped in the past were pretty weak compared to modern ones. As one disarmament activist put it in the current US nuclear arsenal, for example, 
The W-88 warheads deployed on Trident II submarine-launched missiles have an estimated yield of 475 kilotons, compared to the estimated yield of 12 to 13 kilotons of Little Boy dropped on Hiroshima. In 1979, the Office of Technology Assessment in the U.S. tried to estimate the damage that would happen if just the U.S. and the Soviet Union fired all their weapons at each other, with the prediction being that 35 to 77 percent of all people in the U.S. would perish and 20 to 40 percent of the people in the Soviet Union would die. That was with the older bombs. So, in the words of the band REM, this war would be the end of the world as we know it. But we reckon there would be some folks that get through it by living in their six-star bunkers for a decade or two. As much as this certainly is a real threat, we still don't think any world leader would want to initiate global destruction. Let's just hope those weapons never become hackable. Now we need to talk about artificial intelligence. A world ender if ever we've seen one. Number 5. AI Many of you will have heard the name Nick Bostrom. He's an expert on artificial intelligence and he's been outspoken for a long time regarding the existential threat it poses. Like Elon Musk, he believes that a kind of superintelligent AI could wreck the world in a similar fashion to how it was done in the Terminator franchise. On his own website, he talks a bit about the various world-ending scenarios, including a far-out one in which everything in a world is just a simulation, a la The Matrix, and for some reason, whoever programs that simulation decides they're done with it and shuts it down. As for AI, he says we might program it badly, that it leads to utter destruction. In his own words, he says, when we create the first superintelligent entity, we might make a mistake and give it goals that lead to annihilating humankind, assuming its enormous intellectual advantage gives it the power to do so. As an example, he asks, what if we gave this intelligence a mathematical problem, but that problem was so hard it had to turn all the matter in the solar system into a giant calculating device and by doing so, kill us all? Other people have said, what if we told this AI to create a program to ensure the future safety of our planet, but then the AI decides that the only way to do that is get rid of us humans? Musk has similar worries, saying that we might one day create what he called an AI immortal dictator. He said at least when there's an evil dictator that human is going to die, but for AI there would be no death, it would live forever, and then you'd have an immortal dictator from which we can never escape. This intelligence might just decide that we humans are not needed down here. Why it does that we don't know, but if it does, we won't have a chance. Musk explained it like this. It's just like if we're building a road and an anthill just happens to be in the way. We don't hate ants, we're just building a road, and so goodbye anthill. The main concern about AI centers around what some people call an intelligence explosion, meaning we create some AI that is able to improve itself, and so becomes way more powerful than we expected it to in a short time. In Bostrom's words, when it comes to AI, we're like kids playing around with a bomb. He said, we have little idea when the detonation will occur. Though if we hold the device to our ear, we can hear a faint ticking sound. He, Musk, and Bill Gates all believe that even though right now the AI we create couldn't cause much damage, the explosion is possible. Once that happens, what the AI might want could be very different from what humans want. Bostrom explained that the AI's goals might be incompatible with human survival, not because the AI is evil, it's a computer, it doesn't have feelings. He gives this amusing but scary example. Consider a superintelligent agent that wanted to maximize the number of paper clips in existence, and that was powerful enough to get its way. It might then want to eliminate humans to prevent us from switching it off, since that would reduce the number of paper clips that are built. It might also want to use atoms in our bodies to build more paper clips. It may seem silly to talk about a world ending over some paper clips, but in reality, any number of goals could lead to the destruction because the AI just wants to do its job as best it can. This is why we have to be so careful about programming it. Quite a lot of scientists scoff at such a doomsday scenario, and they say we have many other bigger issues to contend with. But some of those issues might be, say, getting rid of viruses or solving some of the world's environmental problems. This is the very reason why we are in the process of trying to develop computer programs that can do that, and we're getting better and better at it. Bostrom believes that we will succeed in developing superintelligent computers sometime around the middle of the century. And if that becomes the reality, we might solve those aforementioned problems, but the Pandora's box we've opened might just end us too. Maybe now you're thinking, okay, simple, just turn the damn thing off when it gets too big for its boots. Bostrom had this to say about that scenario. A free-roaming, superintelligent agent would presumably be able to anticipate that humans might attempt to switch it off, and if it didn't want that to happen, take precautions to guard against that eventuality. 
Lastly, the great physicist Stephen Hawking stood behind what Bostrom is saying. Hawking agreed that soon AI could very well help us to end disease and poverty, but he also said the development of full artificial intelligence could spell the end of the human race. Hawking added, we cannot quite know what will happen if a machine exceeds our own intelligence, so we can't know if we'll be infinitely helped by it or ignored by it and sidelined or conceivably destroyed by it. Ok, now for something a bit more down to earth but equally frightening. Number 4. Super Volcano In 2019, an article in the New York Times read, a giant volcano could end human life on earth as we know it. Hmm, life is really starting to feel tenuous right now. The article talks about the Yellowstone supervolcano which gets an 8 out of 8 points in the Volcanic Explosivity Index. Still, the good news is it's only erupted 3 times in the last 2.1 million years, with the last one being some 640,000 years ago. If it went off tomorrow, the earthquakes would mean massive eruptions of magma and everything for miles around being buried in lava. That would really suck for people nearby, but for folks in the region it would mean their world turning dark because of volcanic ash. Those ash clouds would keep moving all over the US and the result of that would be massive contamination of soil and the possibility of the power grid going down. Outside the US there would also be mayhem. The article in the Times explained, over the short term as the toxic cloud blocked sunlight, the global average temperatures could plunge significantly and not return to normal for several years. Rainfall would decline sharply. That might be enough to trigger a die-off of tropical rainforests. Farming could collapse. The newspaper cited a report written by some European scientists who said the Yellowstone supervolcano going off would become the greatest catastrophe since the dawn of civilization. Still, many scientists would say whoever wrote that article was guilty of hyperbole. They'd say that even though it would be a terrible disaster, not even all Americans would die. There are also bigger supervolcanoes in the world such as Mount Rainier in the US. For sure, a volcanic eruption with its ash clouds could cause many humans to suffer over a long period of time, but one eruption wouldn't end the human race. As an example, there's the theory that the Campanian Ignimbrite eruption 39,000 years ago could have helped wipe out the Neanderthals, but life went on in the long run. 75,000 years ago was when the Toba eruption happened in Indonesia. The theory is that this was the biggest eruption in many millions of years. Scientists say it could have caused a volcanic winter that lasted 6 to 10 years. That's when the earth cooled from all the ash and other debris hiding the sun. After that eruption, the earth's temperature might have been affected for as long as 1,000 years. It's now thought that it significantly decreased the human population and created what's called an evolution genetic bottleneck. It's all theoretical, but there is little doubt that the destruction caused was profound. Again, people survived and life went on, but what if that happened again in modern times? We should also point out that not all experts believe that this eruption almost finished off humans before they really got started. One of them told the BBC, over the last 10 years or so, people have become more skeptical that Toba almost killed off Homo sapiens. Like Yellowstone, Toba is still active today, and while it's very unlikely one single supervolcano eruption could finish us, if by some chance two or three happened all within a few years of each other, well that could be slightly doomful. As the saying goes, there's a first time for everything. Now, we'll talk about regular evil again. Number 3. Human Developed Biological Weapon In his list of possible world-ending scenarios, cheery Nick Bostrom added genetically engineered biological agents. Many other experts also see this as a threat. As if naturally occurring pathogens weren't already scary enough, what if someone let loose a man-made virus? This is sometimes called the lone wolf scenario, something that Hollywood has been making tons of money out of for years. Bostrom explained, with the fabulous advances in genetic technology currently taking place, it may become possible for a tyrant, terrorist, or lunatic to create a doomsday virus, an organism that combines long latency with high virulence and mortality. He also said there's a possibility that we could create a world-ending virus by accident, giving the example of some Australian researchers who, when trying to come up with a contraceptive virus for mice to better deal with them as pests, they made a modified mousepox virus. It had a mortality rate of 100%, meaning that all mice that got it died. Thankfully, that virus was not transmissible to humans, but imagine if one day scientists were doing something to save the smallpox virus and, by accident, they created a monster of a virus. Then imagine it escaped the lab, as smallpox has done in the past. Humans will always research viruses because we want to better understand them and ensure that we can control outbreaks in the future. 
That's why some people call biotechnology both a blessing and a curse. There are accidents, and there are also tyrants, that might want to create a bioweapon. This is what the Future for Life Institute wrote about. Developed nations and even impoverished ones have the resources and know-how to produce bioweapons. For example, North Korea is rumored to have assembled an arsenal containing anthrax, botulism, hemorrhagic fever, plague, smallpox, typhoid, and yellow fever ready in case of attack. It says the cost of developing such weapons has reduced a lot in the last decade or so, and it's now conceivable that the technology could fall into the wrong hands. It's become easier to manufacture strands of DNA, with the same institute saying it could become possible for someone to print deadly proteins or cells at home. In an article published in the Stanford University website, a headline read, Biological Warfare, an Emerging Threat in the 21st Century. In it, Stephen Block, a professor of biological sciences and applied physics, said he is certainly scared of the wrong kind of people getting their hands on something as terrifying as the smallpox virus and then letting it loose on the population. Block said, We're tempted to say nobody in their right mind would ever use these things, but not everybody is in their right mind. He talked about his greatest fear, which is these people developing their own kinds of super viruses. This is sometimes called black technology and means the use of genetic engineering to make viruses more virulent. If such bad people can get their hands on the genetic maps of pathogens, Block says they might be able to create an extremely virulent strain of a virus. With genetic editing tools, perhaps they can make something that renders our vaccines useless. This could end the world. It's a long shot, but it is certainly a cause for concern. If someone could create a super transmissible version of something like smallpox or Ebola or Marburg and somehow release it into populations, the outcome would be awful. In fact, the virus with the highest fatality rate is the rabies virus. The WHO says, once clinical symptoms appear, rabies is virtually 100% fatal. Thankfully, it's not as if anyone could control the minds of rabid dogs and create a global rabid dog army, but a regular virus could be bad enough if manipulated with new tools. Humans have invented something called CRISPR-Cas9 technology, which enables geneticists to edit parts of the genome. In the wrong hands, could a flu virus be created that mankind could not overcome? The answer is, it is not totally implausible. We still don't know if the pandemic of late was the result of a lab leak, but if it turns out it was, just look at the destruction it caused. Now, imagine if something worse was created. Testifying in front of Congress not long ago, Alan Schaefer, the Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisition and Sustainment, said this, Science is revealing the means to weaponize biology and chemistry in ways that were purely theoretical only 10 years ago. As we continue to move forward, it's becoming increasingly apparent that creativity is our limit, not science. The technology is there, and again, we are playing with fire. We'll come back to nightmarish technology soon, but first, we want to show you that a combo of natural causes could finish us off. Number 2. The Killer Combo The Permian-Triassic extinction event is said to be the worst extinction event that has ever happened on planet Earth. It wiped out 95% of all marine species and 70% of terrestrial vertebrate species, as well as a good chunk of the insects. That's why it's sometimes called the Great Dying, and it happened all by itself. It occurred around 250 million years ago, and it might have lasted as long as 10 million years, or as little as 10,000 years, no one really knows. And there are lots of theories as to what went down. Still, some scientists warned that the combination of things that happened back then could happen again. In short, what did happen is incredibly large volcanic eruptions in Siberia caused the oceans to heat up and greenhouse gases to fill the air. When the dust cloud settled, it left a lot of carbon dioxide in the air and things just kept getting warmer, while the water and the soil became more toxic. Meanwhile, massive emissions of hydrogen sulfide and methane further added to the killing off of plants and animals. It was a bad time for everyone and everything. Recently, some scientists at the University of Washington said to create similar conditions, we might not need any volcanic event, although one could certainly help things along. Scientists have said that our current global warming crisis could in the end have a similar impact and we might be heading for what they call a sixth great extinction. One of them said, it does terrify me to think that we're on a trajectory similar to the Permian because we don't really want to be on that trajectory. The same people tell us that levels of carbon dioxide here on Earth are rising so dramatically that we can compare the present to this past event. We are seeing the world heat up faster than it has in 65 million years and the oceans acidifying 100 times faster than they have in about 20 million years. What these scientists are saying is this could trigger a number of events just like in the past. And while killing off animals and plants will take a long time, slowly but surely we could all die. 
it will be a ponderous and painful death, with lots of famine, lots of strange weather patterns, and you could certainly throw in some war over resources when things get bad. One scientist believes that we humans can stop another great dying from happening by cutting back on our carbon emissions, saying, you know what they say, learn from history, because if you don't, you will repeat it. Then again, nature might have its own plan, and even if we can sort things out, the extinction might be down to natural causes. Alright, now for the greatest threat to not just humanity, but the planet itself. Number 1. Nanotechnology After some in-depth research, the Future Humanity Institute came to the conclusion that human extinction was 19% possible by the year 2100. Ahead of war and AI and viruses, there was something called molecular nanotechnology weapons, which you must admit sounds pretty fascinating. First of all, some of you might not even know what nanotechnology is. Basically, it means the understanding and construction of things at the molecular level. Nano comes from a Greek word meaning dwarf, so nanotechnology means the tech of very, very small. Just to make this clear, when we talk about nanotechnology, we're referring to something smaller than 100 nanometers. In just one inch, there are 25,400,000 nanometers. This technology is the next big thing, it's next generation. A tech that will improve medicine, aerospace, energy, transportation, how we construct buildings, electronic devices, and cars, and planes. It will make the products you use stronger and last longer. As one expert put it, nanotechnology will replace our entire manufacturing base with a new, radically more precise, radically less expensive, and radically more flexible way of making products. It is the future, but it also has the potential to do bad things. Scientists tell us that when we can manipulate the molecular machinery of life, we are at risk of creating a catastrophe. Researchers working with nanotechnology have warned us that the technology, while brilliant at creating benign applications, might also be used to make weapons of mass destruction that the world has never seen. Like with artificial intelligence, when we see breakthroughs in nanotechnology, we are well aware that we are playing with fire. By using molecular manufacturing methods, we will almost undoubtedly create nanotech weaponry that could lead to an arms race similar to what we saw with the atomic bomb. As pessimistic as that sounds, you have to remember that we humans never ignore a good technology's potential to do great harm. Even if we don't want to do harm, we will create the weapons just because we think other countries will do just that. Basically, the creation of these new weapons is inevitable, and that's why so many people are now saying they are a major risk in terms of the end of the world. While you haven't been paying attention, governments of the world have been thinking about such weapons. You've likely never heard of the theoretical mini-nuke, a bomb that could weigh just a few pounds and could have the destructive capacity of any large-scale nuclear weapon we've seen so far. A handheld nuke would be bad news. Enough of these things could potentially annihilate us all, and while we haven't made such weapons yet, do you think if we have the know-how, our great governments will leave them alone? According to US media, China, Russia, and the US are already investing billions of dollars into such weapons. When a US physicist and futurist was interviewed by CNBC about this technology, he offered this stark reply. Nanobots are the real concern about wiping out humanity because they can be weapons of mass destruction. If it's not bad enough that governments want to exploit this tech for the common bad, there's also the risk that terrorists and tyrants might get hold of the nanotechnology. That physicist also pointed out that such weapons could act like insects. So on your way to work, you feel this prick on your arm, and the next thing you know, you're frothing at the mouth. Such tech could certainly come in handy if you want to take out a president. If it all sounds a bit too black mirror for you, the US Army Research Laboratory has already created tiny drones that look like insects. Just imagine what you could do with one of those if it was carrying poison. Imagine if thousands of them were released on a community and to the onlooker's eye they just looked like mosquitoes. It's no joke at all. A physicist called them the most horrific near-term nanoweapons, while researchers at Cambridge University announced at a conference way back in 2008 that these things pose one of the biggest threats in human history regarding the complete destruction of every man, woman, and child. Those researchers said there was a 5% chance that even a nanotechnology accident could kill a million people by that date. They also said there was a 10% chance that 1 billion people could die from nanotech weapons. So, in short, if the point isn't clear enough to you already, those who understand are mighty concerned about what humans might create using this molecular engineering. We just mentioned accidents, now we'll expand on that. Let's imagine we've created some tiny insects that do great things such as fly in mass to try and fix a sinking ship. 
Maybe we get so far in the development that these things are so small and so skilled they can also go inside your body and stop internal bleeding or even prevent cancer cells from replicating. This is the future and it could be an amazing place, but the dream of nanobots making the world a better place has a corresponding nightmare. That is, we lose control of them. One person writing about this provided an example scenario. There's a massive oil spill, so we send in the nanobots to go and break down all those harmful hydrocarbons. But those nanobots are highly advanced, so they can self-replicate, and like an unending swarm, they not only eat the hydrocarbons, but they feast on pretty much anything in our natural world. That's it. Game over. This is called the grey goo scenario, with the swarm of nanobots being the goo. They devour everything in their path and humans are unable to stop them since they replicate so fast. If you could somehow program them to do the devouring, you could use the technology as a weapon of mass destruction. This dystopian tale is so far one of science fiction, and these days scientists will tell you that such a thing shouldn't ever happen. But they will also tell you that when we start messing with the nanoparticles, we are walking into an extremely high-risk area. That's why governments are already thinking about the ethics of nanotechnology, and why rampant nanomachines are taken seriously. But even if you don't buy into swarms of tiny machines getting up your nose and eating your insides, you should give some thought to the very down-to-earth concern of governments using these machines to spy on you. They'd also be pretty good at breaking up crowds of protesters. Everyone has their own ways of preparing for doomsday. Some people would rather not think about it while the world burns down around them. Others have a spot reserved in one of the most luxurious doomsday bunkers in the world. One family in a small New England town is stockpiling honeybees. And at the very top of the planet, in the frigid temperatures of the Arctic, a select few maintain a vault that could contain humanity's last hope for survival. Let's start with the best of the best, or at least the richest of the rich. What do the super rich get when they buy into the Opadum complex in the Czech Republic? The answer is pretty much anything they want. The architects of the Opidum have not only created a doomsday shelter, but a doomsday paradise. The complex sits in a quiet valley protected by natural features and a solid concrete wall. The walls are so high that the only way to see inside of the complex is by aerial view or entering through one of the secret entrances. The property itself is 323,000 square feet in size, but that doesn't even count most of the living space deep underground. There are plenty of things to do on the surface of the compound. But if the outside world is irradiated from nuclear war or a supervolcano blocks the sun for hundreds of years, the residents of Hopidum will spend most of their time in the two underground levels of this doomsday community. Each of these levels is 77,500 square feet, with 13-foot high ceilings. So how did the super-rich prepare for their doomsday scenario? By adding all of the comforts they now enjoy to their secure underground community at Hopidum. To keep their clients comfortable and ensure they have everything they would ever need, Opidum has added some key components at their underground facility. There is a garden that is grown using artificial lights, which are programmed to imitate the sun as closely as possible. Of course, they need to include a spa, a swimming pool, and a library, but no doomsday shelter for the super-rich would be complete without installing a theater complex complete with every movie ever made. The underground compound will also contain the basics, such as a medical facility and all the necessary supplies to keep the community healthy, but it also includes custom vaults so the residents can store their private art collections and any other valuables they don't want to lose during the end of the world. There will also be a full-service restaurant and a fully stocked wine cellar to keep everyone happy and drunk. The price tag for reserving a spot at Alpidum is not advertised, which means you'd have to contact them directly to find out, and if you have to ask the price, you probably can't afford it. Obviously, this is not how most people prep for doomsday, but when you have a ton of money, you can go all out preparing for the end of the world. However, there are people who do some pretty insane things to prepare for doomsday even if they don't have a huge budget. One former high school teacher in Ontario named Bruce Beach came up with an ingenious doomsday plan using recycled school buses. He first started planning for doomsday in the 1960s during the Cuban Missile Crisis, but even after we made it through the Cold War, he continued to build onto his doomsday plan. Beach found the best way to utilize abandoned school buses from the school district he worked at was to repurpose them as a doomsday bunker. He would purchase them from the town and bury them underground. As Beach collected more and more buses, he connected them like Legos, forming a labyrinth of tunnels. In the 1980s, he finished his school bus shelter and named it Arc 2. The whole complex is made up of 42 school buses that are completely buried underground with a secure opening to enter the doomsday bunker. He was so proud of his accomplishment, he even rented out his school bus shelter to people to stay in like an Airbnb. Arc 2 has a kitchen, a shower, and several bedrooms. One unique trait that Beach has that many doomsday preppers don't is generosity. He even has said that people have called him up just to ask if they had a space in Arc 2 for them 
if the world came to an end. He always responded that he did. This might be a uniquely Canadian trait as it's very rare for someone to offer shelter to others in their doomsday shelter. One man in China is taking a different approach using the Ark name. Instead of reusing buses, he's taken a page out of the Bible. Lu Zhenghai has spent $160,000 on materials to build up a ship reminiscent of Noah's Ark, except a better name in this case might be Zhenghai's Ark. The reason he's spending so much money on the ship is to protect his family from the worldwide flood he sees coming. To be fair, sea levels are rising, and depending on where you live, there's a chance you could be flooded out of your home. This is especially true for island nations and coastal communities, but Zhenghai wants to make sure he and his family are prepared just in case the entire planet floods. He's building a ship around 65 feet long that weighs 80 tons. His materials of choice are steel and wood to construct the hull of the ship. The inside will then be split into different rooms and sections that will turn the boat into a comfortable house in which his family can live. Another man in China is preparing for the short-term impacts of Doomsday. He's doing this in a pretty crazy way by creating giant yellow balls. Yang Zhongfu has constructed several massive balls made out of steel that are 13 feet in diameter. Each one supposedly can withstand pretty much any type of disaster. He calls these spheres an Atlantis. They weigh around 3 tons and have been painted bright yellow. Zhang Fu claims the design is optimal for surviving sudden global catastrophes such as volcanic eruptions and earthquakes. The way the spheres are shaped allows them to float, roll, or even withstand the force of an explosion. One main problem with the Atlantis balls is that anyone inside would get tossed around. This led to Zhang Fu equipping each metal ball with seat belts. He even claims that the materials used would help someone survive a nuclear blast from a distance. If you were in the ball right next to where a nuclear device was detonated, the giant yellow ball would not save you. But if you were a little ways away, it could protect you from the shockwave as it rolled to safety. Zhang Fu has created a way to prepare for any disaster, but in a different way than many preppers have. His plan is to survive the initial cause of doomsday and then leave his Atlantis structure to try to survive in a post-apocalyptic world. This is different from many doomsday preppers, as he isn't in it for the long haul. He just wants to survive in the short term. Maybe his thought is that if the Atlantis balls couldn't save him from whatever doomsday scenario ends the world, there wouldn't be much left in the apocalypse to look forward to anyway. It is insane how much time and money some people spend on a doomsday plan. This couldn't be more true than one Australian man who's created his safe space high up in the mountains. In Australia, a man named Robert Bast has spent over $350,000 on survival equipment to make sure he's prepared for doomsday. That is a crazy amount of money to spend on supplies if you're assuming the world is going to end, but most of what he stockpiles is expected, such as food, water, and gas. Unlike many other doomsday preppers, Bast isn't building his shelter underground. Instead, he'll be traveling into the mountains for Armageddon. In fact, Bast has built a safe house 1,500 feet above sea level. He makes test runs periodically with his family to ensure they're ready in worst-case scenarios. Bast, his wife, and his kids pile into a pickup truck and speed up the mountain to where safety awaits. So it would seem that in the land down under, the doomsday safe houses are not always down underground. Even more surprising than spending tons of money or living in a school bus is what some people collect to prepare for doomsday. You wouldn't think that bees would be the animal of choice when preparing for the end of the world, but one New England woman disagrees. Kathy Harrison, also known as Doris Day of Doom, is stockpiling honeybees for the end of the world. She collects the bees with her husband and makes sure they're kept happy and healthy. The craziest part is what they plan to do with them when the world ends. When asked this question, Harrison tells people that bees are an excellent source of food. Their honey can be used to make all kinds of nutritious meals, not to mention in dire straits the bees themselves can be eaten as a small source of protein. The bees' wax can also be used as a preservative, which can keep vegetables and fruits fresher longer, but there is another, more unique use that the Harrisons have planned for their hives. When the world comes crashing down, they plan to use the bees and their honey as a commodity to barter with. Since money will have no value in a post-apocalyptic world, food and other important resources will be key. The bees can replenish their own numbers while simultaneously producing honey that can be bartered with. Basically, the Harrisons are using their bees as a cash cow. This will only work if the other people play nice after the world comes to an end. If New England turns into a Mad Max scenario, the bees will probably not be very useful. Some preppers around the world have created their doomsday plan to include no one else but themselves and their immediate family. There will be no bartering and no communicating with others. This led one man to make the basement of his Las Vegas home his own private indoor world. This doomsday prepper has recreated a quiet neighborhood right under his house. It comes with everything, from an in-ground pool to a grassy lawn, and to be fair, the setup seems pretty relaxing, even if it is intended for the end of the world. The tiny houses in the bunker are just a single room, but they have lovely sliding glass doors. 
and inside is everything someone could need to ride out the apocalypse. Even if the housemates don't get along from time to time, they can escape each other by wandering through the small park and staring up at a fake sky. Honestly, if the world has to end, this might not be the worst place to spend the rest of your life. The only thing better than preparing for doomsday with a small village in your basement is by making your entire house a bunker, and that is exactly what one architect did in Poland. This home is called the Safe House and is located just outside of Warsaw, Poland. It was created by Robert Konieczki of KWK Proms as an impenetrable fortress to protect whoever is inside from whatever doomsday befalls the world, including a zombie apocalypse. The structure looks more like a giant concrete block than an actual house when it's in lockdown. It has no windows or doors and is completely isolated from the outside world. But when the coast is clear and doomsday is over, the walls slide back, allowing anyone inside to have a beautiful view of the property. However, when the walls are open, the house is still protected by a solid concrete wall that lines the entire property. The cool thing is that if at any point the people inside the safe house feel unsafe, they can put the structure back in lockdown with the touch of a button. Inside is everything someone would want to keep them busy during the apocalypse. This might be the holy grail of doomsday homes. If you thought the previous preppers were crazy, you haven't seen anything yet. A company called Vivos X Point has an insane plan for some open land in South Dakota. Vivos X Point doesn't plan to build just one bunker, or even a few bunkers, to prepare for the end of the world. Instead, Vivos X Point is building an entire underground city of 575 bunkers to house the last remaining survivors of Doomsday. There are entire towns with less than 575 structures, meaning this underground doomsday city will be bigger than many other South Dakota communities. This will be a no-frills underground city providing only the necessities. However, they do build to suit their customers' needs. Vivos X Point has drawn up four different floor plans that a resident can choose from, so there is something for everyone. It would seem that the people in this region of the United States take Doomsday very seriously, and now they can be surrounded by like-minded individuals in Vivos X Point Underground City. Somewhere between a single hidden bunker and a full-blown city of Doomsday preppers, there is the Survival Condo. This behemoth underground structure looks like a reverse skyscraper. The building descends 201 feet into the earth and can house thousands of people when the end of the world comes. So this might be a good opportunity for many doomsday preppers in the region to explore their options about post-apocalyptic living. The structure itself will be housed in a missile silo that was constructed during the Cold War. It will have 15 floors with all the amenities someone could hope for at the end of the world. The plan includes a dog walking area, a shooting range, and rock climbing walls. Of course, there will be indoor pools with a water park. There will also be restaurants and bars as well as medical facilities to care for everyone in the survival condo. The architects plan to create several redundant power storage systems and water filtration systems. The hydroponic system will grow plants using artificial lights to create a long-lasting supply of food. The plan is to be able to sustain the inhabitants of survival condo for five years without opening the hatch. This would be a much more bougie doomsday setup than your average bunker. The structure won't be for everyone, though. Doomsday preppers who have signed on for the project must share their underground condo complex with others, so it is not for preppers who are solely concerned about only saving themselves. On the plus side, the survival condo will be built deep enough and surrounded by the silo's protective covering, allowing it to survive a nuclear blast 100 times more powerful than the atomic bomb that was dropped on Nagasaki. There is a less expensive option for doomsday preppers in Indiana if they want to be surrounded by a small community of like-minded individuals but can't afford the expensive costs of an underground condominium. Vivos, Indiana is a communal doomsday bunker that feels much more like a large office with some bedrooms than a luxurious bunker. It houses 80 people and is supposed to be able to sustain them for about a year. Everything is shared in this bunker, so it will be imperative everyone gets along. The bedrooms are separated, but the only thing that fits in them is a bed. The common room serves as the main areas of the complex, where meals are eaten and entertainment is enjoyed. What makes Vivos, Indiana different from other bunkers and doomsday facilities is that everything is shared. Like other doomsday communities, this could lead to problems, but the small size and lack of privacy in Vivos, Indiana could exacerbate those issues. This is just another example of the crazy ways people are planning to live out their remaining days after doomsday. Everyone is different, and everyone will want something different at the end of the world. Most people find planning for the apocalypse crazy and not worth doing since there's a decent chance they won't make it. For doomsday preppers who want to live in a community but don't have the money to afford some of those uber expensive options, Vivos, Indiana might be a perfect fit. For those people who are constantly afraid of doomsday happening even when they're on vacation, there's a special hotel just for them. The Felsen Hotel La Claustra is located inside of a mountain. That's right, for doomsday preppers and adventurers alike, there's a hotel that is within a mountain. 
This is appealing for anyone who thinks Armageddon might be just around the corner. In the eyes of doomsday prepper, Felsen Hotel La Claustra is a much safer option than a Four Seasons or Marriott during the end of the world. The structure used to be a Swiss military fortress built specifically to keep people safe inside it. However, this military base has been completely remodeled into a luxurious hotel with rock walls and comfy rooms. For people who want a vacation away from prepping but still want to be secure, they can sleep at Felsen Hotel La Claustra, eat in their main dining room located in a large cavern in the mountain, and walk around the property using subterranean tunnels. In the winter, the entrance is covered in snow, which is beautiful but also a reminder of how remote this hotel can be. Ideally, if the world was about to end and you were on vacation, this is where you'd want to be staying. Perhaps the most impressive and important doomsday preppers of all are those who work at the Svalbard Global Seed Vault. This facility houses a backup supply of all the different plants that humans rely heavily on. This means that if all the crops were wiped out around the world by a global catastrophe, the Svalbard Global Seed Vault would be able to restart those food sources by using the seeds contained within their facility. This vital bunker is located at the furthest northern point that commercial airlines can fly, making it both remote and accessible. The vault itself is located 100 meters into the side of a mountain to ensure everything inside is secured. The environment in Svalbard also has a low humidity and is not anywhere near fault lines, which means it's safe from earthquakes. The entranceway and the vault are located well above sea level to help protect it from rising sea levels, and of course, being that far north means the region is incredibly cold. In fact, the permafrost located in the region creates a natural freezer to keep the seeds frozen for future use. Obviously, those seeds could only be used if the planet wasn't irradiated by nuclear fallout or completely flooded like in Noah's Ark story. But if a global catastrophe occurred and we needed to start from scratch, the Svalbard Global Seed Vault would have the tools to get our farming going again. When you think about it, Svalbard might not be the ideal location for every doomsday prepper, but it is perfect for storing the seeds for all the plants on the planet. A good indication of how crazy preppers can be is in an area found at the local survival surplus store. Owners of these outlets have heard and seen pretty much every insane doomsday prepper in their general vicinity. In Quebec, Canada, one survival store owner noticed that whenever there is political conflict, even if it's just during a divided election, people start to stack up on doomsday supplies. This isn't surprising, as it would only take one nation with nuclear capabilities to start an all-out war ending in a nuclear holocaust, but other events can trigger the insane tendencies of doomsday preppers even if it's nowhere near them. For example, when the Fukushima nuclear disaster occurred in Japan, people in Quebec started to prep for the end of the world. This is interesting because Quebec is very far away from Japan. However, the shop owner noticed that people almost immediately started buying anti-radiation pills, gas masks, and chemical protection suits after the news broke about the disaster. Loading up on all those things because a nuclear reactor melted down on the other side of the world seems extreme, but nothing could have been more normal to the Quebec doomsday preppers. Florida is a unique place. The beliefs of the people who live there can vary, but some are wildly different from the rest of the United States. That's why an interesting pattern emerges in the doomsday prepping community whenever a Democrat has a chance of getting elected. Survival store owners notice that when it isn't an election year and business seems to go on as usual, there aren't many strange purchases in the store, and customers tend to buy regular doomsday equipment like fire starters, water purifiers, and first aid supplies. But whenever there's a chance that a Democrat will become president, there's an increase in a rather unsettling commodity. Gun purchases increase drastically at Florida survival shops whenever an election cycle favors a Democratic candidate or if the race is close. This is surprising, because regulars at survival stores who buy a lot of equipment tend to be doomsday preppers, not anti-government revolutionaries. Then again, sometimes those things can go hand in hand depending on where you are. One store owner noticed this crazy tendency and chalked it up to an odd idiosyncrasy in the region. For the most part, doomsday preppers in Florida seem to be similar to those in many other parts of the world. They buy a lot of supplies during hurricane season or if there's a conflict between major countries in the world. But for some reason, US politics is a driving force behind doomsday preppers loading up on firearms, which is not seen in many other regions. This is a slightly scary thought, as if you put together all the preppers and their firearms, they would have a decent-sized militia. Luckily, the world is still turning and there's a relative peace in the United States, but who knows what'll happen next election cycle if the Floridian preppers get angry. Surprisingly, Canadian doomsday preppers tend to be influenced by politics as well, except it isn't their own politics, but those of the US. Except in Canada, the doomsday preppers don't go out and buy a bunch of guns. Instead, they load up on food. 
there seems to be more fear of economic collapse by Canadian doomsday preppers than war during United States election cycles. Also, Canadians don't appear to be as interested in building concrete bunkers to ride out an apocalypse. Survival store owners admit that their customer base increases when things get tumultuous in the US or during a catastrophe somewhere else in the world. However, there is a very low demand for a fallout shelter buried deep underground compared to other parts of the world. Maybe this is because there is so much undeveloped land that it's super easy to just escape into the wilderness. Or perhaps Canadians just feel secluded cabins on the fringes of civilization work just as well as anything dug under the ground. In France, doomsday prepper stores sell slightly different supplies. This is because of the end of the world fears are different than those in North America. Over the past 10 years, more and more Europeans are embracing the survivalist lifestyle. This is slightly different from doomsday prepping, but some see it as complimentary. According to survival shop owners, politics tend to play less of a role in what preppers buy than fears around the damage done to our planet by pumping greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. These fears influence what doomsday preppers buy in this part of the world. They focus on purchasing water purification systems and wilderness supplies over firearms. This is probably due to the fact that you can't shoot climate change or wage war against it using guns. This brings us to somewhat of a conundrum. People who take doomsday prepping seriously would not want to divulge their secrets. One of the key tenets of doomsday prepping is not telling people where your supplies are or how you plan to ride out the apocalypse. This is especially true if you have a hidden bunker somewhere filled with all those things you need to survive. So there are probably hundreds or even thousands of serious preppers that fly below the radar. Maybe they buy their supplies from different places so they aren't seen as regular anywhere. Or maybe they have other people they trust to buy them supplies. One thing is for sure though, true professional preppers are not broadcasting their location or doing interviews about their end of the world plan if they're trying to outlast everyone else. The sun's gases and plasma swirl like currents in the ocean. Suddenly, an orbiting NASA satellite records a black mass thousands of times the size of the Earth. The satellite sends an ominous warning signal back to its home world. Solar storm imminent. Prepare for blackout. It takes 8 minutes and 20 seconds for the message to reach Earth. By the time it arrives, it's too late. A massive ejection of radiation, electromagnetic waves, and high-energy particles is about to slam into the Earth, and when it hits, a full-on apocalypse could commence. At least that's what some conspiracy theorists and doomsayers would have you believe on the internet. The reality of what has been named the internet apocalypse is much different than the nonsense that's been spewed across the World Wide Web recently. Is the Earth in danger of being hit by a solar storm in the future? Absolutely. Actually, it happens more frequently than you might think. And there's always a risk that the Sun will release a solar flare or a mass coronal ejection that could hit the Earth. Will this solar event send us back to the Stone Age? Probably not. Let's take a more in-depth look at what scientists and experts have to say about the imminent internet apocalypse and its effects on the world. Even though the fantastical claims you'll find on the internet when researching this topic are mostly untrue, there is some cause for alarm. A strong solar storm could knock out electricity grids and with it internet access across the planet. As a species, we rely heavily on the internet for everything from communicating with one another to more vital things such as banking. The internet apocalypse may not destroy civilization but could cause some serious problems. We're first going to go over the scenario that has led an alarming number of people to believe the world will end in the next year or two. Then we'll explain why this is unlikely to happen but why there is still cause for concern. We can only hope that you watch this video before the internet apocalypse commences, otherwise you won't be prepared. In this hypothetical doomsday scenario, the perfect series of events would need to occur within and around the surface of the sun. A giant superstorm is ejected from the star and heads straight toward the Earth. The high-energy particles and electromagnetic waves slam into our planet's magnetic field, causing brilliant displays of the aurora borealis and aurora australis across the planet. Unfortunately, the immense amount of electromagnetic waves penetrate the Earth's protective field and rip through the infrastructure of our society. One moment the world is in the age of digital information, the next it's back to the Stone Age. Most living things, including humans, are unaffected by the solar storm, but people who rely on pacemakers or heart monitors could be in big trouble. That being said, any organism that uses the Earth's magnetic field as a means to navigate, such as birds and sea turtles, becomes lost. Every electronic device on the planet has been fried by the solar storm. Without the internet, the world plunges into chaos. People don't know how to act without their faces glued to a screen. Anarchy breaks out and due to the fact that the electrical infrastructure of every major city on the planet has been overloaded, getting everyone under control becomes a huge challenge. This is what's been dubbed the internet apocalypse by many online. But now, let's examine exactly where the term comes from and what it means and if we're actually at risk of being thrown back into the analog era. 
Sangeeta Abdu Jyoti is a computer science professor at the University of California, Irvine. She wrote a paper in 2021 entitled Solar Superstorms – Planning for an Internet Apocalypse. The paper itself was a means for Jyoti to examine how ready the planet is for a disaster that may disrupt access to the internet. The paper was meant to be a tool for other academics in her field to help them consider the consequences of a major internet outage and the steps that governments and companies should take to mitigate these problems if a solar storm or some other form of disruption in connectivity were to occur in the future. The paper was not supposed to be seen as a prediction of an imminent doomsday scenario. Jyoti's even said she regrets using the term internet apocalypse in her title as it brought far too much attention to the paper, especially from groups of people who misunderstood her work or didn't even bother to read it and used her writing as fuel to spread their messages of misinformation about the world coming to an end. This all came to a head in March of 2023 when internet sleuths stumbled upon an article published by NASA that included information gathered by the Parker Solar Probe, which was launched in 2018. This satellite orbits the Sun to collect data on the physics and atmosphere of our star. Scientists published new data provided by the Parker Solar Probe about solar winds which were discovered to be the result of a natural phenomenon known as magnetic reconnection. Typically, changes in the Sun happen slowly over long periods of time. However, magnetic reconnection is a sudden change that can result in a burst of energy. This information was then misconstrued and incorporated into the rants of conspiracy theorists and people on the internet. They stated that NASA was using artificial intelligence to predict when solar superstorms would strike the Earth. The conclusion of these misinformed personalities was that there was an impending internet apocalypse, and the world would be hurtled back into the Stone Age because of it. Needless to say, none of these things were mentioned in the original NASA report. These conspiracy theories quickly spread and began to use a peer-reviewed research paper that suggested the Sun's solar maximum, or the time period when it's most active, will occur in 2024, one year earlier than previously predicted. This again sent the internet into a frenzy as the coming apocalypse was now just around the corner. And although scientists do believe that the number of solar storms will increase in the next couple of years, there's no evidence to suggest a solar superstorm will knock out the entire internet anytime soon. So, is there any truth to the claims that there is an imminent internet apocalypse? Surprisingly, yes. But before we can discuss what future solar events may hold for our planet, we need to understand what a solar storm is and what damage it can cause. Even though it likely wouldn't lead to an apocalypse in the same way conspiracy theorists on the internet would have you believe. There are still some major concerns that scientists have about solar storms and how they could impact our society. Solar flares and coronal mass ejections can cause solar storms at any moment. These are two different types of eruptions that occur on the surface of the Sun. Both result in humongous explosions of energy and can happen simultaneously or independently of each other. However, each event emits different things. A solar flare releases magnetic energy along with photons at almost every wavelength of the spectrum, while a coronal mass ejection releases gas and magnetic fields. The Sun goes through a cycle that's about 11 years long, where its activity becomes more frequent and intense before slowing down until the next solar maximum. Since the Sun is not solid, it rotates faster around its equator than at its poles. It's this difference in rotational speeds that can cause the Sun's magnetic fields to bend and energy to build up. Oftentimes, scientists explain what's happening on the surface of the Sun as being analogous to a rubber band. As different regions of the Sun rotate at different speeds, the magnetic fields begin to twist like a rubber band. The tension builds and builds until the rubber band snaps. On the Sun, this snapping of the electrical fields results in solar flares, which are the largest explosions in our solar system and can release electromagnetic energy that reaches the Earth in just over 8 minutes. What has the internet concerned is that our Sun is estimated to reach its next solar maximum within a year or two. But it's most important to remember that only 10 or so years ago, the Sun was also at its solar maximum. And we're still here today. Scientists are seeing more sunspots which are indicative of ejections and the twisting of the Sun's magnetic fields. It's estimated that there can be as many as 2,000 solar flares in the Sun's 11-year cycle, but since they happen across the entire surface of the star, not all will cross Earth's path. Scientists also warn that although solar storms are more common during the solar maximum, extreme solar events can happen at any point in the cycle, so in reality the planet isn't in much more danger in the next two years than it is at any other point in time. So what happens when these high energy particles and electromagnetic waves do reach Earth? Solar radiation, waves, and particles are passing by Earth almost all the time. This is why the Aurora Borealis in the Northern Hemisphere and the Aurora Australis in the Southern Hemisphere can be seen pretty much all year round. 
However, problems arise when there is an abundance of high-energy particles and electromagnetic energy as a result of a massive solar flare or coronal mass ejection. When this happens, a solar storm forms that can slam into the outermost layer of the Earth's atmosphere, known as the ionosphere. When the ionosphere is impacted by a strong solar storm, it can cause a degradation in high-frequency radio signals. This is a problem because it can cause planes flying near the poles to lose their radios and navigation. Depending on how strong the solar storm is, this disruption could last anywhere from minutes to hours, which isn't a big deal for the rest of the planet, but for the pilots it would be an unnerving period of time. But what about exceptionally strong solar storms? Scientists know that if strong electromagnetic waves and high-energy particles impact Earth's atmosphere, it can actually change the shape of the planet's electromagnetic field. This could have a detrimental effect on spacecraft such as satellites, ships, and the International Space Station. Down on Earth, the electrical currents in the atmosphere caused by the solar storm could be picked up by conductors within power grids across the planet. If this were to happen, the power infrastructure around the world could be compromised, leading to large-scale blackouts and outages. This would, in turn, technically lead to a type of internet apocalypse where when the power infrastructure went down, no one would be able to access the internet. However, the servers would likely be connected to backup generators, and since most are housed deep underground, would be unharmed by the solar storm. Once the power came back on, the world would once again have access to the internet at their fingertips. However, restoring power might be easier said than done. If the solar storm were strong enough to overload conductors and cause massive power outages, the collateral damage would be extensive. It could take weeks or even months to bring major power grids back on, like New York City, Paris, Beijing, Tokyo, and every other major metropolis. This means people would be without power and without any way to receive communications other than by written or verbal word. This poses a significant problem for areas that might be in the thralls of winter or experiencing intense weather. When we think about how reliant we've become on electronics, the thought of losing power to a solar storm is a frightening proposition. If the power grid went down as a result of a solar superstorm, hospitals would need to run off backup generators until the problem was resolved. Cars and other vehicles would still work, but traffic lights would be out and GPS would be non-existent. Communication between emergency responders and those who need help would also be severely inhibited. An intense solar storm might not cause the apocalypse, but it would certainly lead to injuries and deaths. It's important to note that major solar storms have hit Earth in the past and some yielded significant damage. For example, the solar storm known as the Carrington event occurred in 1859 and resulted in a surge of power through telegraph lines that caused the wires to spark and even electrocuted operators. This solar storm caused the aurora borealis to descend as far south as Jamaica. In 1989, another solar storm overloaded the Quebec power grid, plunging the city into darkness for hours. Then in 2012, scientists reported that a massive solar storm just missed the Earth. The difference between the solar storms of the past and the impact such an event would have on our planet today is that we are much more reliant on electronics than ever before. 1989 might not seem like that long ago, but we have to remember that the internet didn't really become mainstream until 1995 and the first iPhone didn't hit markets until 2007. The human species is much more reliant on electronics and electrical power now than at any point in the past, which is why a powerful solar superstorm could have devastating consequences for our planet. Scientists and other researchers also warn that even though we've become extremely reliant on electronics and technology, we have failed to thoroughly test much of our infrastructure to see how it would respond to such an event as a solar storm. These conditions can be simulated in labs, yet companies and governments have not considered the damage a strong solar storm could do to their power grids and operations that rely heavily on electrical components. In a worst-case scenario, parts of the world could be left without electricity or internet for extended periods of time. It's estimated that such a power outage in the US would cause the economy to lose $11 billion every day that the power grid was offline. What it comes down to is that the solar superstorm could cause some serious damage and lead to chaos on our planet. However, it is highly unlikely that such an event would bring about the apocalypse. Yes, if the power grid went down, people would lose access to the internet. But once the conductors and wires were repaired, electricity would be restored and people could once again gain access to their favorite social media apps and websites. That being said, the internet has become so ingrained in our daily lives that cutting people off cold turkey could lead to some very real consequences. The internet can literally be a drug. In some cases, the body releases dopamine, the pleasure hormone, when a person receives a like on a post. This experience can also be analogous to an addictive drug. 
internet withdrawal is a real thing, and although a solar superstorm is unlikely to lead to a global apocalypse, it could feel like the end of the world to some people if they lose access to the internet. It seems that at any given moment the world is on the brink of an all-out war. Unfortunately, there are now weapons that don't just end wars, but could end the entire world. Maybe we die by nuclear holocaust, a pathogen cooked up in a lab, or a weapon from space. And if that doesn't scare you, the rest of the doomsday weapons in this video will. The world is full of scary, naturally occurring pathogens, but this hasn't stopped multiple countries from saying, hey, we could make this horrible disease a whole lot worse by experimenting with biological warfare. Currently, there are a handful of deadly bioweapons that we know could end the entire world. These scenarios are extremely unlikely to happen, but in a worst-case scenario, bioweapons could be our downfall. During World War II, Allied forces built several factories to mass-produce anthrax. This bioweapon was never used in the war itself, but the bacterial agent still exists and could be weaponized if it fell into the wrong hands. When the anthrax bacteria comes into contact with the body, it can cause blisters and sores to break out in the skin. This can eventually lead to fever and respiratory problems as it enters the bloodstream. If left untreated, anthrax will enter the spinal fluid and the brain, causing meningitis. This causes the brain to swell and oftentimes leads to death. Someone who's infected with anthrax is not contagious, but if a mad scientist wanted to wipe out humanity, this might be one weapon that could do it. By somehow injecting anthrax into food, water sources, or the air, a large part of the human population could be infected. Anthrax would not need to wipe out every human on the planet in order to end the world. If the bacteria was released in high population areas, the large amount of deaths could throw humanity into chaos and society would quickly break down. However, anthrax is not the scariest biological weapon that has been created by the military. In the 1950s, a bacterial pathogen was discovered as the cause of a pneumonia-type disease that was plaguing Australian slaughterhouses. The disease was infecting the animals and killing them in huge numbers. The United States Army Medical Unit saw an opportunity to learn more about the dangerous pathogen and started to infect volunteer soldiers with the disease. Once they understood what was causing the illness, the U.S. military decided it should be weaponized. Q fever was cooked up in a lab, and more than 5,000 gallons of the bacteria was grown. What made Q fever so enticing to the military was the length of time it could survive once deployed. The bacteria could thrive for up to 60 days and it was easily transmitted. These factors, on top of only needing a small number of bacteria to infect someone and make them extremely sick, made Q fever the perfect biological weapon. However, after the United States signed an agreement with the UN Biological Weapons Convention in 1972, the Q fever stash was destroyed and the world sighed a breath of relief. That being said, there's no way to know if all the Q-fever bioweapons were actually destroyed. The bacteria itself causes respiratory problems and pneumonia in humans. This means that if it were to get out, it would spread around the world like wildfire. And if Q-fever was being used as a bioweapon, whoever controlled it could infect multiple regions of the world simultaneously, ensuring practically everyone would come into contact with the bacteria. The death toll could be high enough to end the world. In 2014, the medical branch of the United States military and the CDC developed a way to protect primates, including humans, from the Marburg hemorrhagic fever virus. This was in response to intel that uncovered the Soviet Union had weaponized the virus in an aerosol form. The scary thing about the Marburg virus is that it's in the same family as Ebola. The spread of Ebola can be slowed or stopped due to the way it's transmitted, and Ebola is spread through contact with infected blood or bodily fluids. By taking precautions such as wearing gloves and other protective gear, the virus can be contained. However, the Marburg virus that the Soviet Union weaponized could be contracted just by breathing it in. What made the bioweapon even more terrifying was that the Soviet scientists reported the mortality rate of the virus was around 90%. This means that if the Marburg hemorrhagic fever ever got out of the lab and into the world, it could be devastating. Once it started to infect people, the virus would spread rapidly, killing almost everyone in its path. Like all viruses, each time it infected a new person, the Marburg virus would have a chance to mutate. This could make it even more deadly. If this biological weapon were to become resistant to the drug that the US government made to stop it, the world would certainly come to an end. There are most likely other biological agents that have been developed in the military labs that we don't know about. So the weapon that could end the world may be sitting in a freezer somewhere just waiting to be unleashed. One thing is for sure, the next weapon we're about to talk about could end the world several times over. Nuclear bombs are probably the most destructive weapons ever created. However, a distinction needs to be made between the two different types. There are two classes of nuclear weapons. The two classes of nuclear weapons are atomic bombs and hydrogen bombs. Both are deadly, but one is capable of much more destruction than the other. The atomic bomb is the only nuclear weapon that has ever been used in actual warfare. This was the type of bomb dropped on Nagasaki and Hiroshima at the end of World War II. Hundreds of thousands of people were killed from the nuclear blasts in Japan and the fallout that followed. 
The explosion of atomic bombs is created by fission, or the splitting apart of nuclei of heavy elements such as plutonium and uranium. When this happens, an enormous amount of energy is released. Around 2 pounds of uranium-235 can discharge the equivalent amount of energy as 17,000 tons of TNT. The explosion is huge, and the amount of thermal energy generated heats the surrounding area to several million degrees. With the separation of the nuclei also comes a shock wave that can wipe out entire buildings located several miles away from the initial blast. Needless to say, the atomic bomb is definitely a weapon that could end the world. If a war breaks out where the atomic bombs are fired across the globe, everyone who is not wiped down by the initial blasts will eventually succumb to radiation poisoning or the nuclear winter that will follow. However, atomic bombs are not the most powerful nuclear weapons that humans have created. The hydrogen bomb can be a thousand times more powerful than an atomic bomb. And since the inception of the hydrogen bomb and the realization of their massive power, these are the types of nukes that militaries have stockpiled. The main difference between the hydrogen bomb and the atomic bomb is the way the energy is created. In a hydrogen bomb, the explosion happens due to an enormous amount of energy released by a process of fusion. Instead of splitting nuclei like in an atomic bomb, in a hydrogen bomb, two nuclei are fused together. Hydrogen bombs still use uranium and plutonium, but also have deuterium and tritium added to the mix to create the fusion reaction. H-bombs have never been used in an actual war, but they have been detonated to measure their power. These bombs yield enough destructive power to instantly end the world if they're all detonated at the same time. The largest explosion ever recorded by a hydrogen bomb was over Novaya Zemlya Island in Russia. It was called the RDS-220 hydrogen bomb or the Tsar Bomba. On October 30, 1961, the 50 megaton nuke was detonated with the equivalent of 50 million tons of TNT. This is approximately the same as exploding 3,800 of the atomic bombs that were dropped on Hiroshima. It should come as no surprise that relatively few nuclear weapons are needed to end the whole world. But one delivery system in particular was a major concern for the longevity of the human species. During the Cold War, the United States developed a miniature nuclear warhead and a launcher that could fire it. The crazy part was it could be carried, deployed, and launched by a single soldier. The weapon was called the M28 or M29 Davy Crockett weapon system. It looked like an oversized rifle with a small bomb attached to the end of it. The weapon was wildly inaccurate and very dangerous, which resulted in it being scrapped as the Cold War came to an end. All it would have taken is one rogue soldier making a bad decision to launch a nuke at the enemy. The counterattack would end up wiping humanity off the face of the planet. The Davy Crockett could launch its payload approximately two and a half miles, which was barely far enough to ensure the soldier who fired the weapon was safe from the nuclear fallout. He most likely would survive the initial explosion, but could receive a lethal dose of radiation if he didn't get away quick enough. There was also not a kill switch, so once the weapon was fired, there was no going back. But perhaps the craziest part was that the United States made around 2100 M28 and M29 Davy Crockett weapon systems, and those weapons actually were deployed with NATO forces in the 60s. This meant there was the possibility for individual soldiers to launch over 2,000 nukes from the field simultaneously. This weapon might have been the number one potential catalyst for nuclear war at the time. Thankfully, all Davy Crockett weapon systems were destroyed or disassembled, as far as we know. Another weapon of mass destruction that could end the world wouldn't do so in a huge explosion, but silently. Dirty bombs are the name given to devices that release massive amounts of radiation without the detonation of a nuclear warhead. This is done with a highly concentrated mix of radioactive chemicals, which is then disseminated using regular explosives. The type of radiation that results from dirty bombs is gamma rays, which would rip through the cells of human bodies and cause damage at the molecular level. This can lead to symptoms like radiation burns and also cause mutations in DNA leading to cancer. A series of dirty bombs would most likely not cause the world to end right away, but given time, the amount of radiation that could spread across the planet would be lethal to the human species. The creepy thing about humanity being wiped out by dirty bombs would be the lack of the destruction. Buildings would be unharmed and entire cities would seem untouched. Years after such a world-ending event, it would seem like humanity was just blinked out of existence. That being said, all living things would be negatively affected, leading to a mass collapse in every ecosystem around the world. We're now moving away from nuclear weapons and into the world of world-ending substances. Like biological warfare, chemical warfare has been banned. But that doesn't stop insane dictators and military leaders from using it. The most terrifying thing about chemical weapons is that with enough resources and planning, they can be simultaneously released across the world. In the former Soviet Union, the military created a family of chemicals called Novichok. This weapon is a nerve agent, which means the chemicals block a nerve signal sent from the brain to the rest of the body. The interference of these signals eventually results in vital bodily processes shutting down and causing the person who has ingested the chemical to die. Signs of exposure to Novichok are dilated pupils, problems breathing, and uncontrollable convulsions. After this occurs, there is only death. 
and if the nerve agent was somehow disseminated across the entire world in food or water supplies, it would quickly wipe out a huge number of people. An even scarier thought is if the Novichok could be mass-produced and then airdropped like pesticides from a crop duster across the world, a number of casualties would be even greater. Another chemical agent that could have the potential to end the world would be sarin. This chemical weapon was invented in 1938 by Nazi scientists, and it's also considered a nerve agent as it attacks the body in a similar way to Novichok. When sarin enters the body, it begins to block nerve signals in the enzyme receptors, which then causes the body to convulse and spasm. After some time, the person dies of asphyxiation or heart failure. What makes this chemical weapon even worse than Novichok is that it has the ability to persist in the air for hours or even days after being deployed depending on the weather conditions. The gas itself is invisible and odorless, which means that if it's used in large scale, it will take time to figure out what's killing so many people. Also, if a vast quantity of sarin gas was continuously deployed in one area, wind and air currents could move it across a region, putting countless lives at risk. The creation and stockpiling of sarin was supposed to be banned in 1997, yet as recently as 2013 it was used in Damascus, Syria on rebel forces. It's estimated the death toll was as high as 1,300 people, including civilians and children. Clearly, this lethal chemical weapon still exists, and if deployed across the planet could wipe out much of humanity. One weapon that has the ability to end the world is something that practically everyone can get their hands on. In order to end the world, all someone really needs is a bullet, a rifle, and an important target. Take World War I, for instance. The assassination of Austrian Archduke Franz Ferdinand by Gavrilo Princip plunged Europe into war. The bullet that killed JFK almost caused the Cold War to turn hot. These instances of gun causing mass turmoil could be what ends life as we know it. Imagine what would happen in today's world if the leader of a country like North Korea or China was assassinated. Depending on the circumstances, a single bullet could lead countries with powerful militaries to do crazy things. Taking it a step further, if the assassination of practically any world leader was carried out by a foreign government, it could lead to a global war. Unfortunately for everyone involved, an all-out war today would look very different than it did in the past. The major players would probably end up being the NATO nations versus countries controlled by dictators under the guise of communism. Both sides would continue fighting a war started by a rifle with weapons of mass destruction. Perhaps the end of the world will be caused by weapons not yet built. One such weapon could be the rods from God. Basically, the rods from God would be missiles, bombs, or other destructive devices dropped from satellites in space. The impact velocity would be enormous as gravity would pull the weapon down to Earth from orbit. Such weapons could be something as simple as a solid tube made of heavy metal that could rip through a structure causing it to collapse, or a conventional nuclear bomb. Regardless of what is being dropped from space, the destruction would be devastating. This is especially true if multiple rods from God were deployed all at once. There are currently somewhere around 7,500 active satellites in low Earth orbit. Imagine if each one of these satellites were equipped with this technology. It's not out of the realm of possibility that in the near future, warfare will be fought both in and from space. As space is militarized, the number of satellites will only increase. If that's the case, they will also most likely be equipped with a defense and attack system. The weapons that end the world might not come from Earth itself but from high above it. Weapons such as lasers have been the dream of military leaders for decades. But with the rapid advancement of technology, these death rays may be closer to reality than ever before. In the past decade, the military has been tinkering with ways to mount lasers onto planes to help shoot down missiles. This laser technology is still in its infancy, but it's progressing quickly. Right now, the lasers are mostly being deployed to destroy missiles, bombs, and drones. However, in the future, these high-energy lasers could be used for much more destructive missions. If lasers become large and powerful enough, they could be mounted on planes from where they could shoot down at targets on Earth below. In the future, warfare using bullets and missiles might be a thing of the past. High-powered lasers could continuously rip through military installations and whole battalions of soldiers. They could also be used to destroy buildings and cut down entire cities. And if a laser was powerful enough, it could destroy a planet, just like the Death Star from Star Wars. We are still a ways from that type of laser technology, but it was only about 15 years ago when the first iPhone came out. Now we have high-powered computers in the palm of our hands with internet access pretty much everywhere in the world. Think about what else will be accomplished in the next 15 years. The weapons of the future will likely look very different than the weapons of today, and death by laser might be the way the world ends. Then again, maybe it's the weapons of the past that could lead to the extinction of the human species. In the 1950s, the CIA conducted a series of experiments under what came to be known as MKUltra. This was a covert program to see whether mind control was possible. The theory was that by using psychotropic drugs, the brain could be altered and programmed. The military forced subjects to take LSD, barbiturates, and amphetamines, and then monitored their behavior. It's not entirely clear what the outcomes of the MKUltra tests were, as CIA Director Richard Helms had all the records of the project destroyed in 1973. However, with advances in neuroscience and our understanding of how the brain works, 
Maybe the world will end with a brainwashed spy assassinating a world leader. Or maybe a team of sleeper agents will infiltrate the highest levels of a country's military and detonate their nuclear stockpile all at once. These are all obviously far-fetched situations that would likely never happen, but it's hard to know just how far MKUltra and Mind Control went since all the files were destroyed. Some of the most bizarre military weapons ever created were the result of equipping animals with technological upgrades. During World War II, the United States military toyed around with the idea of equipping incendiary explosives onto bats and dropping them onto enemy territory. This came to be known as Project X-Ray. The thought was that by releasing thousands of fireball bats onto Japanese cities, they could ignite homes, buildings, and other structures, causing everything to burn to the ground. But this wasn't the only experiment with weaponized animals. DARPA had also conducted research around implanting microchips in different animals like cockroaches and rats to allow humans to control them. The animals would likely be used for reconnaissance missions or to collect intel in heavily guarded facilities. However, with the way technology is advancing, maybe it's not too long before we start equipping these animals with explosives that can cause massive damage and casualties. Imagine a war not fought by humans but by cyborg animals that are fitted with bombs, lasers, or even biological weapons. The end of the world might not happen from conventional weapons but from military experiments on animals gone wrong. Humanity could be wiped out by the very creatures we once manipulated for our own selfish purposes. Then again, maybe this is a sci-fi fantasy, and we'll just blow ourselves up the old-fashioned way using nukes. Only time will tell. Watching the TV, it's easy to worry that the world is ending. Between the virus, the riots, the wildfires, things are looking hairy out there. But this is far from the worst the Earth has faced, as earthquakes, volcanoes, and mysterious extinction events have brought life on the planet far closer to midnight. Good news, right? Maybe not. Between global warming, nuclear arms races, and that giant volcano under Yellowstone, it's not a surprise that many people are wondering if the end of the world could come during their lifetime. And if it did happen, is there a way to survive? Obviously, if a massive asteroid was going to come and wipe us out like the dinosaurs, odds aren't good to escape. But many apocalypses are survivable, if you know where to be. Here are some of the best places to survive the end of the world. With most crises, your best bet is to get away from the epicenter of the country. That's why one of the best places to survive the apocalypse is New Zealand, an island nation in the southern hemisphere. Islands have a big advantage in any crisis, as we saw in 2020. They have greater control of their borders, and a relatively isolated island like New Zealand is unlikely to get caught up in border disputes. In the pandemic of 2020, New Zealand was one of the few countries able to isolate fully enough to mostly eliminate community spread before vaccines were distributed. And the island has a thriving economy, plenty of livestock, and decent climate that would allow it to be a haven for many apocalypses. It's one weak spot, as a small island it would be vulnerable to rising seawaters. Its closest competitor as an apocalyptic survival base may be right next door. New Zealand is small, but Australia is massive being the sixth largest country by surface area. Sure, a lot of that is the inhospitable outback desert, and the summer season in what's winter in the northern hemisphere can be brutally hot. But Australia has many advantages for the end of the world, including several thriving population centers that are spread far apart. This minimizes community spread in the event of a plague, as was seen in 2020 when they were able to do isolated lockdowns to clamp down on outbreaks before they spread. It's not likely to be a combat flashpoint in anything but a massive world war, and its large surface area means it's well equipped to withstand a climate disaster, as long as the air conditioning just keeps working. Just be careful of the wildlife, it's notorious for venomous animals. But what if you're looking for something a little cooler? Europe is a busy hub of countries, making it a tricky place to survive the apocalypse, but one country offers a big change of pace. Iceland is located hundreds of miles from any other countries. It's also one of the most energy-independent countries on Earth. The island is full of active volcanoes and uses geothermal energy to power much of its grid. Between that and the island's massive fishing sector, this is one of the best places in the world to isolate. They even came pretty close to an apocalypse when their banking sector collapsed, so the citizens are hardy. But be warned, winters are cold and dark, so while you'll be able to survive there, it may not be a fun time for that part of the year. But what if the oceans themselves are becoming the danger? Rising sea levels are a big concern due to climate change, so one of the best ways to survive the apocalypse is high elevation. Some of these places might be a little more isolated, but can provide long-term safety. While the highest places in the world are inhospitable mountain ranges, a surprising refuge can be found in Bolivia. The Altiplano is the highest plateau outside of Tibet, and it offers a refuge with plenty of fresh water, a brisk, maybe too brisk wind, a stunning view of the mountains, and plenty of food in the form of flamingos. They probably taste like chicken, if you can catch them. 
but another high-in-the-sky refuge offers much greater biodiversity. The Kingdom of Lesotho is a small landlocked nation entirely within the borders of South Africa, and hidden inside it is one of the most stunning natural hideaways in the world, the Kingdom of the Sky. Surrounded by mountains and plateaus, this deep canyon has no fault lines nearby, which means earthquakes and volcanoes aren't a threat. There's no shortage of fresh water, countless species of plants, and local fauna that can easily be hunted for a supply of food. It's also relatively isolated, meaning you're not likely to have too many people crowding your personal haven. But what if when you want to get away, you really want to get away? If you've never heard of Tristan da Cunha, you're not the only one. It's the most isolated, inhabited place in the world. A British overseas territory, it's only accessible by boat, a six-day trip from South Africa. This archipelago has several main islands, including the pointedly named Inaccessible Island. The main island has under 300 permanent residents who make their living primarily by fishing. They're sure to be surprised when they get some new end-of-the-world neighbors, but if you're looking to stay out of the fray, it's hard to do any better. That is, unless you go to the most isolated place in the world. Going to Antarctica to survive doesn't seem to make much sense. After all, it's one of the few places on Earth that has no permanent inhabitants. A frozen wasteland mostly populated by penguins and the occasional researcher who lives there temporarily, it's one of the only places in the world that might get more hospitable as climate change melts the ice. But you should still probably be prepared for bitter cold and come equipped. The good news is the frozen continent is dotted with research stations that may be full of supplies and perfect for camping out. This isn't a place for someone who will go stir crazy with isolation, but if you're looking to ride out a global conflict in the most far-flung place possible and you have the supplies, Antarctica will provide. But hey, there's always penguins if you run out of food. But what if you don't want to get away from it all? Surviving the apocalypse will always be easier in isolated locations, but not all cities are created equal. These population centers are fairly well equipped to survive a global catastrophe. Denver is called the Mile High City for a reason. It's the US population center with the highest elevation, and that makes it one of the most easy cities to defend in a war or other crisis. Not only is it surrounded by mountains, but the city is close to shale oil reserves that give the population a supply of emergency fuel if they become isolated. The climate is temperate and well equipped to handle global warming, with the rising temperatures making the nearby farmland more fertile and helping to make the city self-sustaining. But would you believe the safest place in America is the Midwest? Kansas City is one of America's quieter cities, unless you're a big Chiefs fan. But in a global crisis, it might be the city everyone wants to head to. The coasts are likely to be in the most danger from rising waters or invading armies, and Kansas City is in the middle of farmland, almost a thousand miles from seawater. It's in the center of America's agricultural hub, meaning there will never be a shortage of fresh food if the climate permits. And while it might be out of the way to the biggest cities, it's connected to several major rail lines which should make it easy to bring supplies in and out. But the United States isn't the only country with haven cities. Switzerland has a unique distinction in Europe. It's remained officially neutral in every major war in the last century, and unless it changes that position, that makes it the safest place in Europe during global upheaval. Their capital city, Bern, is surrounded by the Alps, making it harder to invade and allowing greater control of the borders. The region has rich farmland that's getting even more fertile as the climate warms, and its thriving cultural scene and beautiful architecture means it's not just a place to survive the global upheaval, it might be possible to thrive there long term. But what if things got really, really bad? While some regions of the Earth are better for living in crisis, what happens if a nuclear disaster or massive volcanic eruption renders the surface completely inhospitable for a period of time? The good news is there are some isolated locations that just might make it possible to survive. Going back to ancient times, our ancestors frequently survived dangerous climates by hiding in caves, assuming there were no bears inside, of course. In a modern apocalypse, the same holds true, with one cave in the nation of Georgia offering enough space to hide an entire city. Krubera Cave is the second deepest cave known to man, with a massive drop of over 7,000 feet before you get to the massive cavern within. With 8 miles of real estate far below the surface and running water from natural sources, you could easily deploy a team of survivors down there with supplies to wait out the chaos on the surface. Just make sure you have enough food and plenty of light sources and rock climbing equipment. Of course, some of the best havens are man-made, they just won't be easy to get in. If you're a member of the United States Air Force, you should hope you get stationed in Colorado. Not just for the ski resorts in Aspen, but because you'll be working in the most secure base in the US. Welcome to Cheyenne Mountain, a massive military complex underneath a mountain fortified enough to survive a nuclear bomb or crashing meteor. 
The electronics in the mountain, which can monitor around the world, are protected by shielding that can block any electromagnetic waves that could knock out power to the whole country. It's designed as a last-ditch fortress for the US government and is stocked with 6 million gallons of water, enough to keep a large group of people hydrated for a very long time. But that's not the only haven for the US government. Where would Congress go if they had to evacuate in the event of a possible nuclear war? The answer is a luxury resort in West Virginia. The Greenbrier is mostly known today as a popular golf course and hotel, but buried deep under the property is a massive bunker with over 100,000 square feet of real estate. Since 1958, it's been filled with a hospital, pharmacy, and dormitories that can hold up to 1,100 people. Designed primarily for surviving nuclear fallout, it's equipped with decontamination facilities and was built in secret. While its existence was exposed in 1992 and the government ended its lease, the bunker still exists and could easily be equipped with new supplies in the event of a global crisis. This next site is entrusted with the survival of some of Earth's most important organisms. No, not humans. The Svalbard Global Seed Vault is located in an isolated Norwegian archipelago in the Arctic Circle and has a very important role – to preserve a stock of viable seeds from as many plants as possible to reseed the Earth in the event of a global catastrophe. While humanity might survive an apocalypse to heal the Earth, they'd have to restore its biodiversity so that humans can thrive on the surface again. Officially opened in 2008, it's stocked with seeds from around the world and contains just under a million seed samples. It's climate controlled and designed to withstand water overflow during warm seasons. It's probably one of the safest sites in the world, although humans aren't its top concern, with no permanent staff on site. But if you're rich enough, anywhere can be your end of the world haven. Vivos, a private bunker design company, has promised to build a haven for the end of the world anywhere you'd like, even under your home, if the laws allow it. In a modern version of the classic bomb shelters from the Cold War, this company's art-shaped bunkers are designed to withstand a nuclear strike or a climate disaster, have high-tech ventilation systems that ensure clean air, and average about 2,000 square feet. A little cramped, but more than enough to house a family in a crisis. The starting cost? $35,000, which isn't the highest tag, but the more amenities you want, the higher the price tag. The question is, how many of the world's super-rich already have their apocalypse survival plan built into the ground under their house? September 2022, after a six-month military buildup, the People's Liberation Army launches an invasion of Taiwan. The United States, which has long warned that it would defend the fellow democracy, makes good on its promise and declares war on the People's Republic of China. As the United States and China become embroiled in a bitter South Pacific war, Russia seizes the opportunity to test NATO resolve and launches a full-scale invasion of Ukraine, with troops also pressing into Latvia, Estonia, and Lithuania. NATO responds in force, led by US European Command. World War III has officially begun, and it'll be the most destructive conflict ever waged by man. Luckily, though, you're prepared. China's six-month-long buildup for an invasion of Taiwan has given the entire world enough time to prepare for the inevitable showdown between the US and itself. And because you're a smart infographics viewer, you know that Russia could use the opportunity to attempt to restore its old Soviet glory by forcibly reuniting breakaway republics. So you've prepared for the nukes to start flying, and they almost certainly will, by pooling money together with several friends and family members to buy a boat and a whole lot of fuel. Because soon it's going to be up to you to restart civilization. The first nukes fall after the first three weeks. No one is sure who fired first. Given America's edge in conventional firepower, it's likely Russia or China launched first to attempt to neutralize the edge. At first, it's just a series of small, tactical weapons used against massed military forces and American carrier groups. The US responds in kind. Soon, city busters are falling all around the globe, irradiating capitals that have stood for hundreds of years. You hear the final transmission from the President of the United States of America before the entire world goes silent for good. He's buried somewhere in a classified bunker, and he urges Americans and the rest of the world to remain strong. We can and will rebuild. Turns out, though, his location isn't nearly secret enough and a Chinese deep-penetrating munition collapses his bunker. By now, the US has already repaid the favor to Chinese and Russian leadership. Forget this we nonsense because now it's up to you to rebuild civilization. Luckily though, you're prepared and you've chosen just the place for it. You've had to carefully do your homework though, because you need a place that isn't just remote, but has all the necessary survival features you need to make a new life. That means food, shelter, and water but it also means a place that's distant enough from the irradiated wastelands of North America, Asia, and Europe to keep radioactive materials from suffocating you. That latter is probably your greatest concern. 
Hundreds of nuclear weapons have been dropped all over the world, putting as much radioactive dust and particles into the atmosphere as a massive supervolcano eruption. At this point, avoiding irradiation altogether is simply impossible. Anything living that needs to breathe is going to be ingesting some amount of radioactive material. However, by finding the right place to restart civilization, you can limit how exposed you become. To that end, you've settled on a small chain of islands known as Tristan da Cunha in the South Atlantic. Here, the trade winds blow almost straight east and do so with great zeal. This means radioactive dust is going to get pushed away from you as it drifts toward the southern hemisphere. Your only concern is radioactive debris from Australia, which, thanks to its cooperation with the United States, has taken several nuclear hits as well. However, major military targets in Australia are along the northern coast of the island continent, and there the trade winds pick up dust and debris and blow it in a northwest direction. It's not perfect, but on Tristan da Cunha, you're about as safe from radioactive debris clouds as you're going to get. You're still going to be sucking down irradiated dust though. This is a simple fact of life, and you can expect your lifespan to be shortened by two or three decades. It's going to be a long time before anyone celebrating a hundredth birthday again. However, you can limit the damage by consuming charcoal, which will help absorb irradiated particles in your stomach and pass them through your system. The dust that settles in your lungs is the real problem, and wearing a mask will help, somewhat. The islands aren't uninhabited, and that's both a positive and negative. The positive is that the island chain's only permanent settlement, Edinburgh of the Seven Seas, is a small fishing and farming community. While they do import a lot of things, they're perfectly capable of sustaining themselves and have done so for 200 years. The negative is that because the island is inhabited, you're going to have to be dealing with other people who may not be so keen on sharing what they have, especially with the world having officially ended. Luckily though, sea life is abundant on the island chain, so you better get used to sushi because you're going to be eating quite a lot of it. The influx of two dozen more people may make some of the locals grumble and complain, but they're easily able to absorb the numbers given the island's abundance of fishing resources. Thankfully, the locals are actually very friendly and can't turn a boat full of people in need away. The additional mouths to feed can be offset by available fish and other seafood, and the volcanic soil of the island makes for great farming. While normally about half the island is a dedicated wildlife preserve, given the circumstances those rules are lifted. Bad news for the many of the native bird species, but human life takes precedent. The normal rules allowing only two cows per household are lifted, though the limit can't be increased much more even with the addition of more grazing lands, so each household is now allowed a maximum of three cows. This will make meat rare, something you'll get to enjoy maybe once or twice a month, but you'll have plenty of farm-grown crops to enjoy and fish. Um, did we mention fish yet? What's even better is that the farming is done by hand or with the assistance of animals, and you realize there's actually very few gasoline-powered vehicles on the island. The lack of modern farming equipment is something the locals have had to make do without a necessity before. Fuel would have to be imported all the way from the mainland Africa, making it extremely expensive. Now though, that lack of modern farming equipment is a lifesaver, as it means the locals have learned and preserved more ancient methods of farming that don't require a resource you'll never see again. This does unfortunately mean that the local power plant won't be putting out the electricity much longer, and you'll have to learn to make do. Despite being so close to the Antarctic, the weather rarely ever dips below 50 degrees, which is good news because there's very little plant life on the island and few trees. That means no firewood, which means no roaring fires to keep warm at. You'll just have to learn to bundle up when it gets cold. The place does get lashed by rain pretty frequently though, which is actually a good thing. While there's a freshwater source on the island, rains will give you a chance to replenish cisterns. You'll be taking in a few rads by drinking rainwater, but at this point everything you do is exposing you to radiation. You'll need to earn your keep, so as soon as you arrive, you and your group are put to work. There's plenty of crayfish fishing to do. In fact, before the world ended, it was the island's primary export. There's also farming to be done and animals to be tended to. Given the desperate state the world is in, the local government council opens up the other islands, natural preserves and UNESCO World Heritage Sites before the world ended, for exploitation. You and a group of men take a boat over and harvest some of the bird nests there to help supplement your diets. You're careful to leave enough untouched that the bird population will hardly notice the loss. There's enough birds to live in equilibrium as long as your island doesn't explode in population. The fact that there is a government is also a good thing, because order means stability. The local government is democratically elected and has an election every three years. The island council, as it's known, consists of 14 members, and they meet about six times a year. Back before Great Britain was bathed in nuclear hellfire, the town was English territory. With the Queen being radioactive dust now, though, that matters little. Along with the island council is the chief islander, who's sort of like the island's president. He's too democratically elected every few years. 
The best part about the island, though, is its remoteness. It's over 1,700 miles from the nearest continent, Africa. That means any other desperate refugees are unlikely to make the journey or even know about the island in the first place. All that binging infographics show really paid off in the end. But there are problems with this little slice of would-be paradise. The first is the fact that the island is still an active volcano. The volcano rarely ever has a major eruption, the last one being in the early 1960s. But back then, the entire community had to be evacuated to mainland Britain by the government. When they returned, many of their homes had been destroyed. You will have to live under the shadow of imminent destruction for the rest of your unnaturally short life, and a large enough volcanic eruption could not only wipe out the small community, but bury the critical farming and grazing land under volcanic ash and lava flows. The death of the livestock would be a huge blow to your survival chances, but the loss of farming land might be the death knell for humanity. Luckily, this is unlikely to happen, but it's something you must worry about every day. The second problem is that medical resources are extremely limited. There is a single doctor on the island, but for anything requiring even moderate levels of care, including surgery, the locals have to ask for help from the mainland all the way in South Africa. This was always going to be a concern in an end-of-the-world scenario, but with no hospitals to raid for supplies, you can expect life expectancy to drop significantly for the survivors of the end of the world. The other major problem, however, is the fact that most of the island's residents are older, leaving few available women for repopulation. This is unsurprising, as most of the island's younger residents often choose to leave for Britain or South Africa, leaving behind an island of mostly pensioners. The island is believed to have been originally inhabited by four or five families, though, and most living residents can trace their lineage back to these original settlers. So as long as you brought a few women not related to you, you might have a chance of making a future for humanity that doesn't look like another Hills Have Eyes sequel. Those pensioners are going to die soon enough. In fact, they'll be dying much sooner than normal thanks to the sudden lack of mainland medical care, medicines, and the airborne radiation everyone's ingesting. That means you have limited time to learn the traditional survival techniques of the people. But there's an even bigger problem. You'll soon be left without most of your workforce. These numbers will have to be replenished, and soon, or the entire settlement simply collapses. For the women who have to come along, this means only one thing, babies. And you can't afford to be picky about your partner because to ensure healthy genetic diversity, women are going to have to be making babies with most available men. The traditional values of monogamy and marriage are going to have to be temporarily suspended until humanity isn't living on the brink of extinction. All in all though, you've really chosen the best place to try and bounce humanity back from nuclear extinction. While the temperature will drop a few degrees, you're glad to hear that old nuclear winter studies were overly pessimistic in their estimates. You should be able to survive long enough to pull humanity back from the edge. Of course, getting humanity back to the mainland is another problem altogether. The journey is six days by motorboat to South Africa, and gasoline will have run out long before your descendants are ready to leave the island. You can't store gasoline either, as it'll eventually go bad. However, humanity has made incredible voyages lasting weeks before in pretty rudimentary craft. That's how South Pacific Islanders came to inhabit such far-flung locations as Hawaii. So odds are good that thanks to your solid judgment and watching infographics show, humanity will rebuild. Probably only to destroy itself once more in nuclear hellfire, but hey, you did your job. The Emergency Public Broadcasting Network goes live across America with the familiar long beeping noise. Seconds later, it's followed by a warning that the President of the United States of America is about to make an address to the American people. But a wealthy family of fine living in an affluent Texas community doesn't stick around to hear it. In fact, they've already been rushing around the house to gather last-minute essentials and shoving them into their family car. The family has paid hundreds of thousands of dollars into a survival subscription service of sorts, and that comes not just with a safe place to ride out the apocalypse, but up-to-the-minute updates on national and international disasters and crises. Their doomsday company has close ties with the US military and intelligence apparatus, paying a premium for hot tips from intelligence leakers. Thanks to those tips, the family has been aware of the end of the world for a full 15 minutes before anyone else. They all have dedicated go bags filled with clothing, medicine, and other essentials. They're also allowed one additional bag for whatever else they might want to bring, but they need to act quick and fill that bag up within five minutes to make their strict schedule. Their survival shelter has already been pre-stashed with clothing and the specific medical and health essentials each family member needs, so there really isn't much left to grab except for sentimental items. Things like photo albums, important paperwork, and family heirlooms were stashed in their private bunker years ago. Even if the apocalypse never came, it was a handy place to store valuables. But the apocalypse has come, and the family is rushing out the door. They have a very strict timetable to keep if they're going to get to their shelter in time. The family has managed to wrangle one of the cats and the family dog. Yes, their shelter even comes with room for amenities for them, but the second cat is nowhere to be found. 
In the panic of the family prepping to leave, the poor thing got scared and ran to hide under a bed. There's no time to look for it. Mittens will have to ride out the apocalypse along with the rest of the poor people. Despite the youngest son's wailing tears, the family rips out of the driveway and heads along a very specific pre-planned route. The route will avoid major traffic traps expected to become even worse in the case of a disaster and sticks to back roads as much as possible. The destination is a discreet airfield right at the very edge of town. The place is normally a tiny airport for local flight enthusiasts who can afford their own planes, but today it's salvation for this family. The route has been pre-planned down to the minute. If the family can't get to the airfield in exactly 17 minutes, their waiting ride will leave without them. They have been warned to take all measures necessary to reach their destination on time. This includes muscling other cars out of the road or even doing things like driving on sidewalks. There's a very real ticking clock on the survival of the human civilization. This is not the time to play nice. In case they get stopped by anyone, the father is armed with a 45 caliber firearm. Both he and his wife have been trained in its use by former U.S. Special Forces members. They have made it clear that nobody can prevent them from reaching that airfield. Use of the gun is up to his discretion. Tearing through the back roads, the family finally manages to make it to the airfield, and with not a moment to spare. Nuclear weapons have set travel time from any of the several likely launch points in either Russia or China, and the family is working by that timetable. The helicopter waiting for them already has its rotor spinning, and the moment the family is on on board it lifts into the air. Their car is left forgotten on the tarmac. The helicopter turns north and puts on a burst of speed. There's no radio on board and the family has been told to ditch their cell phones. News of the outside world has no way of reaching them and that's by design. Psychologists have determined that knowing what's going on can be detrimental to mental health, and it might lead one or more of the family members or even the pilots to do something drastic. Instead, the helicopter speeds north as the sun begins to set. An hour later, the helicopter is at last approaching its destination. It's right on time. Washington, D.C. and Seattle have already been obliterated by nuclear weapons. Portland and New York City went shortly after. Enemy nukes are targeting northern coastal cities first, but will shortly after make their way down into the heartland as they fly over the North Pole and south into America. By the time the chopper lands, Denver, Colorado has been hit. The family can even see the glow of the nuclear impact in the distant horizon as the helicopter lands. Moments later, there's a bright flash in the distance as two nuclear weapons impact American ICBM missile fields in Colorado. There's two men in body armor and camo uniforms waiting for them, both heavily armed. They shout at the family, go, 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 as each panicked family member struggles to grab their bags. There's little time to waste, and the men are aggressive and pushy. The two pilots help by grabbing the kids' bags. The group runs together to a yawning door set into a thick cement structure. As soon as the soldiers, family, and pilots are all inside the doors, they're slammed shut. A giant mechanism turns, and the doors seal with a loud metal clang. There's another set of doors for the group to go through. These are airtight and seal with a hiss as the family passes through. In the small chamber waiting for them are several showers. These are for decontamination in the case the family was late. Later though, they'll serve to decontaminate the security teams who sweep the post-apocalyptic wasteland for threats to the complex. Passing by the showers, the family opens one final hatch to reveal a steep flight of stairs going down and an elevator. The complex is powered by diesel generators, but the stairs are a backup if the power goes out. For now, the group shuffles into the elevator and are greeted with pre-selected calming music. The first stop is for the pilots and security personnel. These are former special operations soldiers hired by the company behind the shelter to secure the facility in case of apocalypse. In exchange, they've been given a place to stay in the shelter with their families. However, their quarters are separated from the family's private quarters a few floors beneath. In order for the elevator to even go down there, the father or mother have to put their eye up to a retinal scanner and speak a voice command. The computer analyzes the voice and eye scan and authenticates their identities, allowing the family to continue their trip down to the bowels of the earth. When the doors open up, they're greeted with a large, spacious open space. There are water features along the walls that fill the chamber with the soothing sound of running water. UV lights feed a variety of plants especially modified to thrive underground. The walls are painted off-white, a color psychologists have determined to be soothing in times of extreme duress. The chamber is a common area of sorts. Beyond it are three bedrooms, two for the children and one for the parents. There's also a large living and dining room where the family can take meals. There are windows throughout the complex, and each window is in fact an LCD screen that plays an image of a sunny day outside. Each screen is synced together and the weather will change naturally through a pre-programmed year-long cycle. The high-definition screens will bring the family simulated weather as if it was a real window. Yet another feature psychologists have determined will help reduce mental stress. Inside the bedrooms are large, luxurious beds. Flat-screen TVs hang from the walls and are wired directly into the complex's computer system which has tens of thousands of movies, TV shows, and all other matter of electronic media to enjoy. 
Before arriving, the family was given a thorough psychological screening that included a long, exhaustive list of TV shows and movies. They were each asked to rate a show on a scale of 1 to 5, and using the aggregated data, the designers were able to build a digital library that should prove entertaining for the years it'll take for life to resume up top. The children have a massive closet that's filled to the brim with all matters of toys. In compartments built into the rock itself are more toys, those deemed suitable for older children. The kids will be able to enjoy appropriate entertainment options as they age up to 18, and only the parents have access to the storage compartments, so surprise can be maintained. There's even gift wrapping supplies for birthdays and holidays. Attached to each bedroom is a private bathroom. All the water in the facility is recycled, though the facility also has access to a very deep reservoir of groundwater. The reservoir has been carefully studied and mapped with ground-penetrating radar to ensure that in case of nuclear war it would be resistant to contamination. To be on the safe side, though, the facility has a robust purification system System to handle both recycled water and freshly pumped water from the reservoir, and a host of sensors will warn the occupants should radiation or contamination levels in the reservoir reach unsafe levels. The family won't have to ration water for a very, very long time, and the psychological comfort of long, hot baths or showers will help them weather the end of the world. Solid waste, though, is also recycled and used to fertilize a grow room full of crops that the complex will be eating. Family members of the security staff work the grow room, again in exchange for their place inside the bunker. Meat options, however, are very restricted. There's a huge walk-in freezer inside the kitchen that's stocked with huge supplies of flash-frozen meat, but it won't last forever. The designers of the Doomsday Bunker recommended that the family eat meat sparingly, perhaps two or three times a week. In this way, the family will actually experience a common American diet at the turn of the 20th century before meat became universally affordable thanks to cheap feed such as corn and sardines. There are two common areas, the living room and the entry chamber, designed to resemble a small botanical garden. The family has been given instructions on how to keep the garden alive, but there is one member on staff upstairs who happens to be a botanist. He'll be helpful not just in keeping the small grow room alive, but the plants around the complex as well, which are seen as a vital mood booster. When everyone's ready to return to the surface, he'll be responsible for making crops grow again with the aid of the small seed vault also included in the underground complex. The living room is decked out in ultra-plush but durable couches and chairs. There's also a very large big screen TV here. It too connects directly to the complex's computer library. Along with movies and TV shows, the complex also has two of every major video game system going back to the PlayStation 2. There's one final room in the family's part of the bunker complex, and this one is secret even from the security and service staff above them. It's a panic room where the family can shelter in case the bunker is invaded or if the staff turn on them. The room also has an emergency exit that leads to a very long underground tunnel, which eventually makes its way to an alternative exit in a field several hundred meters away. The exit has been camouflaged to look like a small mound of grassy dirt. Precautions have been taken to keep the family safe, but the heavily armed security team of 12 above them could turn out to be just as big a threat to them as to any would-be invaders. For that reason, measures have been taken to provide the staff and their families a good level of comfort. Though paling in comparison to the luxury downstairs, the staff do enjoy private accommodations and multiple common areas. Starting a month after the bombs have fallen, the security staff will begin routine patrols of the surrounding countryside. Their job is to look for security threats like roving bands of raiders or people desperate for shelter. They are heavily armed, and the bunker is equipped with multiple heavy weapons. A squad of 12 would easily defend themselves even from a larger force from the safety of multiple fighting positions built around the complex. However, the security staff will also regularly listen for radio broadcasts to ascertain the fate of the world. If there's any functioning government left, if there is, they're equipped with long-range communications equipment to make contact and hopefully be rescued. Psychologists have spent a significant amount of time trying to figure out how to prevent the security staff from simply taking over the bunker and kicking the family out. Other than the radiation and nuclear bombs outside, the complex's own security staff may be the biggest threat to the family. With their wealth incinerated along with the rest of the world, there's little leverage the family has left over their staff anymore. Only human decency and cooperation will keep the staff from turning on them. But just in case that isn't enough, the father and mother have access to one last security measure. With the Press of a button and a voice command, the bunker will go into lockdown mode, shutting everyone out of the family's quarters. The lockdown can even be tailored to specific rooms, in case the staff or invaders have forced their way into the family's floor. Then, the powerful ventilation system will begin to pump inert gas into the entire complex. The same system that'll quickly extinguish any fires should they arise can also be used to asphyxiate the entire complex if it poses a threat to the family. As the world burns above them, the family settles in for a nice night of microwave popcorn and Jim carries the mask. It's 1940. The Nazis have just embarrassed the British at Dunkirk. Adolf Hitler appeals to Britain to step down, otherwise what will happen will be the destruction of a great world empire, the destruction of which was never my wish or aim. Soon after Dunkirk, the Germans march into Paris. 
Hitler calls this the most glorious victory of all time. Hitler says Britain will fall and so will the Soviet Union. As for America, he states, I don't see much future for the Americans. It's a decayed country. Hidden in an elaborate compound somewhere in the Santa Monica Mountains, the LA Nazis are screaming for joy. The Nazis, they say, will defeat the US and Adolf Hitler will rule from his palatial Hollywood HQ. We guess some of you are now thinking the infographic show is high on drugs. Or more likely you think that this is one of our fictional scripts. It's not. But we'll forgive you for thinking that. Little do most people know that at one point in time there were the LA Nazis, and they really believed their mustachioed lunatic of a savior would arrive in the US and praise them for their service. And this is how it all came to be. Before the US entered the Second World War on December 7, 1941, many Americans had been dead set against their country fighting in Europe. In May 1940, after the Germans had blitzkrieged through Belgium, the Netherlands, and France, a poll was taken about joining the war. 93% of Americans said this is Europe's fight. We should stay well away from that holy conflagration, leave them to it. This wasn't because the vast majority of Americans supported the Nazis, far from it. It was because they didn't want to send young men over to Europe to die. That had already happened in World War I. Did Americans really want more body bags coming back from Europe? No is the answer to that question. Still, there were many people who were behind President Franklin Roosevelt when he said in March 1941 that the US would become the greatest arsenal of democracy. This is when Congress passed the Lend-Lease Act. It meant that the US could supply the British with weapons, planes, ships, and ammunition. But there was more going on in terms of American machines and tools being used in Europe. The giant American car companies Ford and GM were both later accused of helping the Nazis. Ford was said to have served as an arsenal of Nazism. GM said it lost control of its car plants in Germany, but there are those who have good reason to be skeptical. Some years before this, when Adolf Hitler was not yet at war but was enthralling the Germans with his bellicose speeches, General Motors' World's publication covered an event he spoke at. The story applauded this supposedly great man, saying things such as how wonderful he was with kids. Part of this multi-page story said, By nine, the streets were full of people waiting to see Herr Hitler go to meet the children. As for Henry Ford, he was no doubt an anti-Semite. After all, he was behind the publication of The International Jew, The World's Problem. Ford talked and wrote about the so-called Jewish problem. This impressed the Nazis. Hitler said Ford is a single great man. He once told a journalist in Detroit, I regard Henry Ford as my inspiration. He even had a portrait of Ford hung in his office in Munich. When Hitler hit the age of 50, Ford in Germany gave him 35,000 Reichmarks as a gift. Some years later, when the US Army liberated the Ford plants in Cologne and Berlin, they discovered company documents talking about the genius of the Fuhrer. That's not surprising when you hear that the only American person talked about in a positive light in Hitler's book Mein Kampf is Henry Ford. Was there rampant anti-Semitism in the US during the time of Hitler? Is the Pope Catholic? Might be the best response to that. In the same book, Hitler talked about the need for racial purity and how he thought he could make that happen through eugenics. This would later become the Nazis' extermination program. In the book, Hitler said, The German people should occupy themselves not merely with the breeding of dogs, horses, and cats, but also with care for the purity of their own blood. But let's remember who was a world leader in eugenics? The USA. Hitler admired the US for this, and he very much liked that the US still had a ban on interracial marriage. There were plenty of people in the US in the 1930s and 40s who agreed with Hitler when it came to racial purity. Hitler knew this. He once told a fellow Nazi, I have studied with interest the laws of several American states concerning prevention of reproduction by people whose progeny would in all probability be of no value or be injurious to the racial stock. He was, dare we say, proud of the US after it introduced sterilization laws. Hitler knew he could do the same to prevent untold numbers of non-Aryans from ever being born. In fact, in 1934, Joseph Desjarnet, the superintendent of Virginia's Western State Hospital, complained in the Richmond Times-Dispatch newspaper that the Germans are beating us at our own game. That same year, having seen how many people the Germans were sterilizing, a California eugenic leader named C.M. Goethe praised Hitler and the rest of the Nazis for their epoch-making program. All this is important when we consider the LA Nazis. As you know, Pearl Harbor happened, and before you could say schadenfreude, the US was fighting the axis of evil on the side of the Allies. This didn't mean everyone in the US was happy about that, not only because of the inevitable bloodshed, but as you'd seen, plenty of people in the US sympathized with Nazi ideology. Since 1936, there had been a German-American Bund, 
which was essentially an American Nazi party. Some of these people were desperately looking for scapegoats on which to blame their woes. Many of them blamed Jewish people for the economic crash that caused so much hardship in the US. They also blamed immigrants for things such as the usual refrain of taking our gerbs. They wore the Nazi insignias and did the Nazi salute, they marched in the streets, and the membership grew at an alarming rate. These nationalists were buoyed by the fact that a real American hero was on their side. He was the famed aviator Charles Lindbergh, undoubtedly one of the USA's most celebrated national treasures of the era. He was against American intervention in the war. He spoke at rallies held by the isolationist group America First. He was the life and soul of the isolationist party, and the Nazi party was quite fond of him too. Hermann Göring even decorated Lindbergh with the service cross of the German Eagle. Was Lindbergh really a Nazi sympathizer though? It's hard to say. President Roosevelt once told one of his officials, if I should die tomorrow, I want you to know this, I am absolutely convinced Lindbergh is a Nazi. He said to another official, when I read Lindbergh's speech, I felt it could not have been better put if it had been written by Goebbels himself. Still, at times Lindbergh seemed to criticize some aspect of Nazism. He was definitely anti-communist, but he was also very fond of talking about white Euro-Americans' racial strength and the threat of its dilution by foreign races. Lindbergh once told his many adoring American fans, Europe and the entire world is fortunate that a Nazi Germany lies at present between communistic Russia and a demoralized France. At that same time, he told them the fake news and propaganda was being used by the war agitators, the British, the Jewish, and the Roosevelt administration to get America involved in the war. And we're not talking about a small following here. Lindbergh's fan base certainly can't be compared to some monstrous far-right groups we have nowadays that hide in the far reaches of the internet, incessantly going on about their racial superiority. This was a guy that drew huge crowds when he talked. Sure, many of his supporters just didn't want to see young American men getting chewed up on the battlefields of Europe, but a lot of them, and we mean a lot, thought that the white race was superior. Some of them sympathized with the Nazis when the Nazis were talking about the so-called Jewish problem. It should be noted that these Americans didn't yet know about gas chambers or torture under what the Nazis called the Jewish solution. But as you know, eugenics was fine for many people. Racism was still rife in America. There was racial segregation in the South. There was racism on TV. As you can imagine, that most hateful group, the KKK, wasn't exactly against the Nazi ideology. These brainless lynchers and pathetic crossburners would have felt at home in Satan's toilet sharing it with Hitler. Few books have been written on the subject of Nazis and the Southern racists, but one we found said they did indeed praise Nazi Germany. As the young black college student Henry E. Banks said back then, the Nazi regime is bad, but are we in the US guiltless of this sin? The thousands of members of the racist Nazi supporting paramilitary group called the Silver Legion would have said there was no sin. These guys were totally on Hitler's side. Their leader, aka the White King, once said, the time has come for an American Hitler. They went around saying that the land of the free couldn't ever be free until it was rid of Jews and blacks and other minorities. They were even against the Irish coming over to the US. We guess these folks never spent much time looking at their ancestry and its history of immigration, nor the fact that at the end of the day, we all have the same ancestors despite genetic evolution giving us different shades of skin color as our ancestors crossed the globe. The Silver Legion wasn't exactly clued up when it came to evolutionary theory. Anyway, now that you heard all this, are you really that shocked that high in the hills over the Pacific Palisades, there was a group of Nazis hiding in a secret compound, waiting for the day that Hitler marched into the US and started doing the things he'd been doing in Europe? LA, by that time, was no stranger to Nazi sympathizers. In the summer of 1933, when Hitler had just become Chancellor, a bunch of American fascists held a joyful event at a downtown beer garden called the Brown House. This was the same name as the Nazi party offices in Munich. They had no idea that a spy named L1 had sent someone to watch over the events. Later, the Nazis would find out about L1 and called him the most dangerous Jew in Los Angeles. Now you may wonder why the Nazis thought about LA at all, but the US being as powerful as it was back then was always under the Nazi radar. The Nazis also understood the power of film, and Hollywood, of course, was the movie-making mecca of the world. Film was and still is entertainment, but it's also a great tool of propaganda. You'd be surprised how many movies you like that have been influenced. Hitler thought a lot about LA and Hollywood. He even once sent one of his own filmmakers to the studios of the up-and-coming Walt Disney. 
The filmmaker remarked after her visit that it was gratifying to learn how thoroughly proper Americans distanced themselves from the smear campaigns of the Jews. Disney himself used to attend meetings of the German-American Bund, which as you remember was the American Nazi party. Did Hitler want a power center in LA? Sure, he did, if he could. The Nazis said this city was even more important than New York, which is why they were in regular contact with the LA Nazis. Hitler and Goebbels were often on the phone with them issuing direct orders, according to an article in the New Yorker. Two of these Nazis were Norman and Winona Stevens. Norman was a wealthy mining engineer and Winona, an heiress herself to a small fortune. One of her main interests was metaphysical and supernatural phenomena. So when she was told by a guy only known as Herr Schmidt that he'd seen her in a vision that Hitler would soon rule the USA, she took it seriously. The wealthy couple was now sure the Nazis would win the war, and one day they would arrive in the US, so they decided to build a palace for them. They spent a whopping 4 million bucks making this palace, which is about 85 million in today's money. It's thought they might have gotten much of that from the Nazi party. They got to work on the landscaping first, which included creating vast gardens, a terraced hillside, water facilities, and a power station. Huge electronic gates were constructed at the entrance of the ranch. The main house was to be a four-story mansion, decked out in the best furniture money could buy. This was hidden down a hill about 650 steps from the gate. The reason for this placement was to ensure if anyone attacked the house, they'd see what was coming at them first. The only way in was through the gate, and there was a gatekeeper's house with a direct line to the main house. Also hidden was another small house just for the chauffeur. The plans were drawn up by one of LA's famed architects, Plummer, Werdeman, and Beckett, who were also behind the design of the Pan Pacific Auditorium. The gardens that surrounded the plot were purposefully built to accommodate a range of vegetables. There was an irrigation system to ensure the plants didn't die, there was a diesel fuel tank, a great big meat locker, and generators all over the place. And this was so the occupants of the house could live there for as long as they wanted and remain self-sufficient. The New Yorker called the place Hitler's West Coast White House, adding that it was to be what San Clemente was for Nixon or what Mar-a-Lago is to Trump. Hitler's house was to have 22 bedrooms, a swimming pool, a dining hall, exercise spaces, a dairy, a library suite, a music room, a laundry, maid's quarters, and the pièce de résistance, a large meeting room where Hitler and his guys could talk war planning. In the foyer was to be a fountain surrounded by the 12 signs of the zodiac. All around the ranch in the hills, American Nazis would act as stormtroopers, each trained in marksmanship and hand-to-hand -hand combat. Just to give you an idea of what it looked like at the time, this is what one of the visitors to Hitler's planned utopia said. A guard was also employed who unlocked the gate to admit me. The entire property was surrounded with a chain-link fence topped by barbed wire. A few people were present on the grounds. Goats, sheep, and cows were kept on the flatlands at the bottom of the canyon. The construction was moving along fine for a while. They had the gardens ready and the basic infrastructure was laid down, but they hadn't quite started on the main house when things suddenly changed. That was when Pearl Harbor was attacked by the Japanese and the US found itself embroiled in a war all of a sudden. The day after, the FBI arrived at their plot and arrested everyone, in all about 50 people. And that was the end of the dream. No building happened after that. If you go there today, you can still see parts of the project, the rusty pipes and the smaller house, but not much else. As for what happened to the mysterious Herr Schmidt, an LA Times article titled Trouble for Traitors dated June 30, 1940, seems to suggest he existed, that he fought in World War I and was known to US naval intelligence. And Norman and Winona Stevens, it seems, were released after a while. In 1948, they sold the plot to Huntington Hartford Foundation to be used as an artist colony. The colony shut its doors in 1965, and later in 1975, the city of Los Angeles bought the plot. It was only in 2016 that most of it was partly demolished, and some of it secured due to too many kids venturing down there and getting hurt. We imagine many of them had no idea they were wandering around a place designed for Adolf Hitler. A zombie apocalypse is inevitable, at least if humanity lives long enough for evolution to have its way. In the smash hit The Last of Us, the world is ravaged by a fungal infection which begins attacking humans, turning them into brain-dead pseudo-zombies who exist only to further spread the infection. But this scenario is far more science than science fiction, and the terrifying part is that this fungus could begin infecting humans and Gwyneth Paltrow might be to blame for the end of the world. Ophiocordyceps unilateralis, or just cordyceps, or zombie ant fungus, is a special type of fungus that isn't content to simply munch on dead things. 
Like the rest of its fungus brethren, Cordyceps instead wants to accelerate the process by making things dead faster. This terrifying fungus evolved to attack ants and spiders, leeching onto them and slowly draining them of all their life-sustaining fluids and nutrients. But what is truly horrifying is just how smart this fungus is. Ants are its preferred host, but ants are pretty surprisingly tidy creatures. Whenever an ant dies, it's dumped in a special part of the ant nest where wastes of all type is deposited. These chambers also happen to be rich in other fungi and bacteria, which attack organisms that might be harmful to ants. In a way, the ants have developed both a sanitary system and preventative medicine. Some ant colonies are even able to detect individuals infected with a variety of pathogens and preemptively drag that individual out far away from the colony to die where it can't infect anyone else. But cordyceps have outsmarted the ants. This zombie fungus knows that it's unlikely to infect many ants if it sucks its host dry and then simply leaves it to die where its body can be disposed of. Like other parasitic fungi, cordyceps needs to bloom and disperse infectious spores over a wide area. Typically, ant disposal systems make this impossible or significantly reduce the effectiveness of the bloom. And that's where the mind control comes in. Rather than leave its host to die wherever it happens to fall, this evil fungus takes over the host's mind and compels it to perch somewhere high up above the ground. Typically, this will be somewhere near where other ants roam, with the infected ant grabbing onto the trunk of a tree or a tall plant and then simply waiting. However, the fungus is smart enough to make the host look for a humid environment where its parasite will have the best chance of growing. The fungus then drains the ant of all nutrients and when done begins to bloom, bursting out of its ant host body. The fungal bloom then explodes with parasitic spores which rain down from above on unsuspecting insects. Ants may have developed preventative medicine, but this fungus has learned how to wage biological war from above. The most terrifying discovery that scientists have recently made, though, is that cordyceps may not be mind-controlling their hosts at all. When inspected, infected ants are found to have fungal growths that penetrate into nearly every part of their bodies. But while researchers expected to see the fungus penetrate deep into the ant's brain in order to control it, they were shocked to discover that there was only a slight presence along the brain. Instead, they realized that the fungus is penetrating deep into the ant's limbs. The implications are terrifying, because this might mean that instead of mind-controlling a host ant, the fungus is leaving the ant's brain alone and simply hijacking its body. Imagine being fully aware of everything you're doing, of the fungus slowly covering and penetrating every tissue of your body, but unable to stop it from forcing you to do whatever it wishes. What if the zombies and The Last of Us aren't brainless monsters after all, but fully aware that they are attacking and biting other people? Imagine being one of the mushroom zombies trapped by runaway fungal growth in a wall for decades, fully aware of everything going on around you, and just watching the hours turn into days, days into weeks, weeks into years, and never being able to do so much as shout for help. Just waiting, waiting, and watching. This is the nightmarish reality that ants and spiders infected by cordyceps face every day. But could cordyceps infect humans? No. And yes. The thing about zombie fungi is they're extremely specialized organisms, so specialized in fact that one strain of the fungus can only infect a specific species of ant or other insect. This has limited the growth of each strain of cordyceps, and in all likelihood prevented an all-out ant apocalypse, which is pretty good news considering how surprisingly important these tiny creatures are for our world. More importantly though, this inherent infection limit also limits just how successful each strain of the fungus is, which helps close the door on the type of genetic mutations that drive evolution. But it doesn't shut the door all the way, more on that later. Every single breath you take is full of fungal spores. When you walk out into nature, you're inhaling a venerable buffet of spores from all different species. Frankly, it is a miracle that advanced life is possible at all given the possible infection vectors one single breath exposes you to. But thanks to our immune system, an infection is incredibly unlikely. Specialization amongst different species of infectious fungi also makes it impossible for them to affect us. Humans also enjoy one other advantage shared by most mammals. We run hot. Evolutionarily speaking, mammals were an extreme long shot, and frankly, it's a miracle that it paid off. We run much higher body temperatures than other animals, and that gives us a host of advantages over them. It also means we have to consume a frankly absurd amount of food to keep our bodies running. And that high running temperature also means that we're basically immune to infection by a lot of very nasty organisms, including fungi, which could try to mind control us. Most fungus loves warmth and humidity, 
and the human body is great at producing both. Some of you only need to look in between your toes or under your armpit for proof of just how much fungus loves parts of the human body. But growing inside your body is another matter altogether, because most fungus taps out at 98.6 freedom units. At these temperatures, fungus wilts faster than the Russian army in the face of light opposition. In The Last of Us, a new variant of cordyceps infected humanity via its food supply, and this is both the most and least realistic part of the show. A global infection from one single origin source is quite possible thanks to the interconnected nature of our world today. COVID took the world by storm within weeks of its discovery, and everyone loved it so much that it made multiple global encores that last to this day. However, COVID was transmitted via the swap of bodily fluids and, uh, according to some, by 5G cellular towers. We're kidding. No need to blow up our comments about COVID being transmitted by 5G towers. We know that's conspiracy theory. As many astute Facebook scientists know, 5G towers only transmit monkeypox. A simple sneeze or even rubbing your eyes, nose, or mouth was enough to leave infectious residue all over the place. But cordyceps needed to be transmitted via the food supply, apparently living off the plant matter until it reached a human host. And if you thought that was far-fetched, think again, because if you go and take a look at your refrigerator right now, start reading labels, you might be shocked to discover just how far your food has traveled to reach your face hole. The United States is the world's largest food exporter, leading the way in exporting corn, soybeans, and wheat. Its annual exports number at $118.3 billion, and entire countries are reliant to the point of famine on the food exports from the US and other major producers of food. Leading the way in export of fish is China, with Indonesia exporting half the world's entire palm oil supply and Thailand exporting a third of the global rice supply. Food exports are such a big deal in the modern interconnected world that Russia, never shy about finding reasons to be a global supervillain, remains under such intense global pressure that it's forced to allow Ukraine to export its wheat and other agricultural products. With the US exporting 50.5% of the world's soybeans, imagine if a soybean-loving mind-control fungus infected just one farmer's field. Soon it would reach all over the planet. However, that's the most realistic part. The least realistic part is becoming infected via ingestion. The stomach's acidity and low pH balance is enough to kill most fungi, and humans regularly consume fungus for health reasons. Many supplements and probiotics are loaded with fungus, and humanity consumes both by the millions of metric tons. And if you're specifically worried about cordyceps infecting humanity, then worry not, as Gwyneth Paltrow sells a cordyceps-infused $200 breakfast smoothie on her Goop website. But is Gwyneth Paltrow helping usher in the end of the world? Is she on the side of the cordyceps? Is Gwyneth Paltrow secretly an assembly of fungal growths in the form of a neurotic, delusional blonde woman selling people useless crap for hundreds of dollars a pop? The answer to all these questions could be, probably is, yes. For now, cordyceps can't infect humans for a variety of reasons, including that we run too hot for it to handle. But evolution is a powerful force, and only organisms nimble enough to respond to outside pressure have made it to this day. Today, the world is warming thanks to the generous donation by humanity of absurd amounts of greenhouse gases directly to the atmosphere. As the world heats, organisms must learn to adapt or die, and cordyceps could adapt too. Already, we're seeing organisms adapting to rising temperatures, and formerly tropical diseases are now spreading far outside of their historic geographic boundaries. Transmission vectors like mosquitoes are taking full advantage of global warming by expanding into even greater ranges than before and staying active for longer. Mosquito spread has already been linked to the spread of diseases like malaria, dengue fever, chikungunya, and West Nile virus. What's especially troublesome is that these diseases and cordyceps tend to inhabit environments where, until recently, human numbers were historically low. This limited their ability to spread, and for cordyceps, less exposure to humans meant less chance for a natural mutation to lead to infection. Somewhere out there in the sands of time, there could have been a strain of cordyceps which accidentally mutated with the ability to infect humans. But because none were around, it never got a chance to, and it died out or that particular mutation could still be coming and could perhaps repeat. With evolution, given enough time and a whole lot of nightmare outcomes become possible. With the world warming, these diseases are spreading out of their normal range and coming in contact with more humans, and the fact that we keep building cities closer and closer to untouched wilderness is only hastening the process. Already, the risk of fungal diseases, such as those caused by aspergillosis, histoplasma, blastomyces, and coccidiosis is on the rise, and it's not just because of global warming. 
Our widespread use of antibiotics also do a good job of wiping out competitors to fungi, giving them a clean sheet to work with as they take over our bodies. But fungal infections spreading from human to human would be pretty unlikely, hence why cordyceps needs to literally explode out of its host to spread spores, and why mushroom zombies bite people in The Last of Us. A fungal infection should be relatively easy to contain, but if that were the case, then why is science failing to contain the spread of a very real fungus which has started infecting humanity on a wide scale? Candida auris is a relatively new fungus first identified in 2009. Unlike other fungi, this one absolutely loves warm temperatures and has begun infecting the bloodstream of humans where it causes severe, potentially life-threatening infection. Its cousins are actually pretty common, especially in places like hospitals, where they're responsible for irritating but not life-threatening yeast infections. However, C. auris is much more aggressive and can be spread from person to person relatively easy, leading to widespread outbreaks. To make matters worse, the fungus is resistant to many drugs and traditional treatments. Clinicians are forced to treat the symptoms, helpless to do anything about the actual infection, leaving it up to the body's immune system to fight it off. Research is underway for treatment options, but fungal infection is one of the most underfunded parts of medical research around the world, with only an estimated 1.5% of all research funds dedicated to this area. C. auris literally exploded onto the scene, popping up in multiple continents nearly simultaneously. Scientists suspect it was always here among us, but rising global temperatures were exactly the change that the fungus needed to make its move to humans. It's been reported in over 30 countries to date, and while infection presents no serious risk to healthy people, it can be deadly for the elderly or those who are immunocompromised. Fungal infections seem set to rise over time, and they come with a double shot of bad news. First, there's very little incentive for pharmaceutical companies to research treatments, with fungus like C. auris only presenting a real threat to the elderly or immunocompromised, the company has little financial incentive to develop a treatment which will have a very limited market. For those affected, good luck, we hope you don't die, but there's just no profit to be made in saving your life. And hopefully while we ignore dangerous fungal infections, they don't evolve to pose a serious risk to healthy people. The invisible hand of the free market strikes again. The second problem with treating fungal infections is that fungi are much more closely related to humans than to viruses or bacteria. This makes treating them difficult because the same treatments which destroy a fungus can also destroy healthy human cells. The same drug which might be effective in preventing you from turning into a fungi-controlled zombie could also be killing you or weakening you to the point that you simply acquire some other equally deadly infection. It seems like if humanity doesn't get lucky, we might just be screwed by the invisible hand of nature. Now go check out US Military Actually Has a Zombie Plan, or click this other video instead.